welcome to the TV White Space Ecosystem event. I am Obakeng Ratloko from the CSIR, the Communications Practitioner, and I will be your Program Director for the day. On behalf of the CSIR and FCDO, we are welcoming the representations from the government, namely the DCDT, the DSI, TIA, ICASA, and the KZN Premier Office. We have an honorary guest among us this morning from the British High Commissioner who will be providing the keynote address this morning. Not to waste any further time, I will be welcoming Dr. Rachel Chikwamba to officially open up the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, and um, good morning to everyone, and you're all very welcome uh, to the CSIR. I do see quite a lot of my own colleagues in the room, but our guest of honor, uh, the British High Commissioner, Anthony, you said I could call you Anthony, very welcome. Uh, you've, we were born in South Africa, and so that's a point of pride for us, because as far as we're concerned, perhaps you're one of the lot. But um, colleagues, good morning and you're welcome. Colleagues from the DSI, from ICASA, you're also very welcome to this event. This morning we are here at the CSIR, a public organization that is charged with the remit of undertaking multidisciplinary directed research in collaboration with other parties in areas that we deem important at any one point in time for the purpose of improving really the, uh, the quality of life of the people of South Africa, but of course we contribute significantly to the quality of life of humanity and we take pride in doing that work. Our vision is one of uh, socio-economic transformation. We think deeply about acceleration of innovation to improve the uh, quality of life, but also the fortunes of many given the history of our country and the inequalities that lay therein. We think also about doing this not just by ourselves, but by doing this collaboratively. Now, we have a number of strategic objectives. And the strategic objectives include a focus on strong research and development, really discovering work that drive uh, industrial development, that drives societal improvement, that drives the capability of the state to drive, to support and provide um, a capable state. So I suppose that that power ding is nothing serious, I hope. All right. Today we're here talking about the work that we're doing with the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office we have sponsored a program on accelerated technical support, monitoring and evaluation for rural TV white space network operators. This is the initiative that you're supporting. But perhaps before I delve into that particular initiative, let me step back into a little bit of the history of what we've been up to in this particular space. Over the past 10 years, the CSR has done intensive research and development in the area of affordable information technologies to support unserved and underserved rural and township economies in South Africa. We talk, about, we talk a lot about the digital divide, and I think the work that we've been doing has been designed to tackle this. And in fact, when we talk about underserved and unserved, we think about our remote rural communities, but even urban townships do have such challenges. And they impact particularly women, the youth, and those who are disabled. We have done work that has resulted in the development of products, and uh, products in the CSR TV white space technologies include technologies that support 
the national regulator of ICT in South Africa, the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, ICASA, and I acknowledge my colleague from ICASA who is in the room, to efficiently manage the national spectrum resources. We also develop technologies to enable TV wide space network operators to provide affordable broadband services in their communities, meaning the minute they can also connect to the internet, they can get access to services, access to information, access to information that can improve education, improve health, include the business enterprises that they try to run. And this has been brought to bear by really a convergence of efforts here. The efforts now of the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, ourselves as the CSIR as an intermediary, and the UN Development Programme. The UNDP funded the implementation of the TV white space and white Wi-Fi network infrastructure to enable four beneficiary SMMEs to provide affordable broadband services for communities across four provinces in the Eastern Cape, the Western Cape, the Free State and KwaZulu-Natal. The selection of beneficiaries targeted women, youth and people with disabilities the generally underprivileged, as I indicated earlier. The Foreign Commonwealth Development Office complemented the UNDP-funded implementation by supporting the four beneficiary SMMEs, who are the network operators, to sustain their businesses through capacity building, mm -hmm ongoing technical support, monitoring and evaluation to ensure that things continue to progress and their businesses continue to grow and they continue to save their communities. We have already achieved significant impact since last year. This is a two-year program. The number of communities connected to broadband internet by the four beneficiary SMMEs, i.e. the network operators, is 32. Over 25 institutional stakeholders, directly or indirectly, are involved in the initiative. 36 job opportunities have been created by the beneficiary SMMEs. And over 660 public facilities, households and businesses connected to broadband internet by the four beneficiary SMMEs. If you think about the era in which we live, where we rely very much on digital platforms for service access, for education, for banking, this is a very significant uh, milestone and a very significant initiative. When you think about the numbers, you might think that they are small numbers, but when you think about 660 institutions and households and how many people they serve in turn, then you realize the potential impact of this initiative. And in fact, when you think about what we can do and learn from this initiative, you realize that we can replicate it and do a lot more, building on our learnings. Just to conclude, the road ahead, of course, involves sustaining the above achievements and really continuing to leverage the support that we've received from the Foreign, well, the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, include participation of stakeholders, which is necessary to ensure that we've got continuity and continued sustainability of the initiative, that we can increase our reach to the unserved and underserved, and that we can increase the number of beneficiary SMMEs who in turn facilitate reaching more communities, more people, and uplifting more lives in our country. And hopefully this is an initiative that we can learn from and expand on further within the region. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome everyone to this occasion where we network, share ideas, share progress, and share how we can improve. Once again, welcome to the CSIR. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rachel Chikwamba. Without any further ado, I would like to invite the Honorable Anthony Philipson, the British High Commissioner. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I enjoyed the dramatic pause after the Honourable. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very British bit of 
dry humour. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much indeed for the very, very warm welcome. Um, it's wonderful. You have never been onto the CSI, CSIR campus. This is a wonderful, wonderful facility. A bit of a hidden gem here in Pretoria, and I hope that we will be back with my colleagues many, many times for discussions like this and across the whole breadth of the really important agenda that you are all pursuing. So, Dr. Chikwamba, thank you very much indeed, as I say, through you to all of your colleagues for your warm welcome. Um, it's great. Uh, I have some of my team who are with me uh, here today, um, who, knew, who are the ones, of course, who've done the real work that you're about to talk to you today, so I'd also like to offer my thanks to them. I'd also like to just uh, acknowledge the other members of the South African Government Departments who are here, uh, all really important partners for what we are trying to do in and with South Africa. Um, I'm especially delighted to be here for the beginning of this CSIR TV White Spaces uh, Stakeholder Workshop. Um, I actually had the privilege and the pleasure of witnessing some of the fantastic work that is done through this program on the ground when I visited uh, Umdansani Mobile in the Eastern Cape uh, earlier this year. And I saw on the agenda, but I don't know, where is Songizo? Is Songizo here from Umdansani Mobile? He's one of your speakers later. Maybe he hasn't made it yet. <laughs> okay, he's coming. Please say hello to him uh, in my absence. I would have loved to have seen him again because the enthusiasm, the commitment that he brings to that project uh, out in Umdansani is genuinely not only um, you know, compelling, but it's just, it's really, really inspirational. Um, and it was wonderful, as I say, to see the program at work on the ground. The fact is that creating and delivering uh, more inclusive internet and digital access for all uh, is a crucial part, of course, of ensuring inclusive economic growth and opportunities for communities across the whole of South Africa. That's why the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, or FCDO as we call ourselves, through our digital access program, collaborated with CSIR to assist the rural TV white spaces, SMMEs, in running profitable and sustainable businesses. The project, as Dr. Chikwamba said, expands on the partnership between the UNDP and CSIR through technical support and capacity building. And while there have been great strides made in exploring new technologies to ensure that communities in hard-to-reach areas are more connected, the fact is that too many are still left behind, as they are without access to affordable and reliable internet. And according to the World Bank, 32% of South Africans do not have access to affordable internet, excluding them from fully participating in not only the digital economy, but actually increasingly the real economy. And that sense of digital poverty uh, I think is a real uh, challenge for the country and it is something that the UK is very, very committed to working with South Africa to addressing. And through the TV White Spaces program, um, I think we are seeing evidence uh, from the shared goal of providing affordable connectivity that that goal is achievable <coughs> with the potential of creating employment opportunities for young people uh, and especially women in an increasingly digitised South African economy. In addition, alongside that, I think the, re the recent auction of the high demand spectrum was another important uh, and good example of the South African government's commitment towards reducing the cost of mobile data and ensuring improved internet connectivity for all. As we've all seen, down in KZN, there were devastating floods in April, and uh, my uh, condolences to those affected by those through uh, the KZN uh, Premier's office who are here today. Uh, the UK has supported some of the relief efforts on that through the Solidarity Fund, uh, but again, we are committed to working with KZN as it, as it builds back uh, from those devastating events. And of course, as we saw, huge numbers of people left without homes and currently housed under community centres. AdNotes, one of the SMMEs through their network, played an important role in providing connectivity, ongoing connectivity, to those members of the community in KZN affected by the devastation. And this, of course, is just one of many impact stories that I think should encourage all of us to continue supporting initiatives that make a difference in the lives of ordinary citizens day to day. Today is actually the last day of Youth Month uh, here in South Africa. And so again, uh, I think this is an opportunity to celebrate the youth of South Africa who have made and continue to make great contributions in this important program. Uh, it is not just for them, but they are doing a huge amount to deliver it for the whole country. In closing, I'd just like to focus on the role that uh, those whose uh, contribution have been made to this program uh, has been so immense. Um, if it were not for them, then we wouldn't be making the strides towards digital inclusion that I think we are, and we would not be meeting our ambitions for making greater strides in the future. And I'd also like to end by acknowledging the efforts of the CSIR team uh, leading up to this event, uh, for organising this event, and providing us all, I think, with an important platform 
uh, within which to evaluate the work that has been done and set ourselves new targets and new ambitions for the work that we are going to do together to create a better digital future. My colleagues and I, not just those who are here this morning, but across the whole of the South African network, look forward to continuing to supporting not only this important agenda, but also the broader CSIR projects, as I mentioned at the beginning, and seeing how we can all, working together, make a meaningful difference to lives and livelihoods for people across this country. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the very, very best for the discussions you're having today, and thank you for letting me say a few words at the outset. Thank you. Thank you very much, British High Commissioner. I would like to welcome the ICASA representative, Mr. Philemon Molefe, to come to, to the front, and he will be addressing us based on the engineering and technology. He is the engineering and um, rather sorry, he is the engineering and technology executive of ICASA. Thank you, Mr. Molefe. Thank you, uh, Program Director, for the opportunity uh, just to share some of our achievements, uh, uh, in particular in collaboration. And then I'll say good morning uh, to uh, our colleagues uh, from the department, uh, the event uh, organizers and the uh, delegates from various uh, the departments as well as the industry at large. So I've, I've tried to refrain from uh, utilizing technical language in terms of just sharing the information, in particular the, the road that has been traversed uh, so that we come to the successful conclusion and promulgation of the regulations that allows, you know, uh, universal access uh, to the communities out there. Uh, and pardon me. How, how do you utilize this? <laughs> Where do you press? Sorry. Yeah, in terms of the uh, presentation outline, like I've indicated that I'm not going to be too technical. So, so, so what will I'll be touching on uh, is just to give a brief uh, mandate of ICASA uh, so that uh, most of the people uh, out there, uh, they're not even aware what ICASA is all about. Then I'll talk to briefly about the high-level TV white space architecture, because that informs uh, the regulations that were put in place. That were put in place. And then I'll also talk about uh, the TV one space regulatory framework milestones. Where do we come from? It's been a long, long journey uh, to come to uh, the the making TV white space available for the benefit of the underserved uh, communities. Also, I'll talk about the, the pre-implementation of those particular uh, framework, what we did in the interim before we finally implement uh, the TV white space framework. Also, I'll give an indication and highlight some of the mandatory requirements that should be met uh, for the use of TV white spaces. In terms of the organizational mandate, of course, uh, ICASA is just one of the creatures of statute. Uh, it, was, it was established uh, in, in 2000 uh, via the ICASA Act of 2000, but most importantly, 
uh, is pursuant to Section 192 of the Constitution. Whatever we do, we should take into consideration the provisions of the Constitution. And then in terms of the broad mandate, uh, ICASA is to regulate the electronic communications and broadcasting, including postal services, in the interest of the public. What's most important again, which now aligns to why TV white spaces were made available for the benefit of the public, is to ensure of affordable services of high quality for all South Africans. Now, in terms of the architecture, like I've said, uh, I'm not going to be technical. In fact, this architecture shows the most important elements of the TV white spaces. You've got two spectrum, uh, geolocation spectrum databases systems which are important, one being the reference geolocation uh, database. That's the key. We call it a reference because that's the, the database system that determines the availability of TV white spaces. And then the other uh, system, uh, uh, database system is the, is the secondary one. That one is also crucial because that one, it will cal calculate and generate the operational parameters so that the white space, uh, uh, white space devices can have access to those TV white spaces. And then also you have the devices themselves, which eventually provide uh, 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 the necessary uh, services. And then there is a protocol that is being utilized between the TV white space uh, devices and the secondary geolocation spectrum database to ensure that the, 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 TV, uh, the, the white space devices get access uh, to, to, to the geolocation uh, database services. Now, in terms, this is very interesting. Now, in, in terms of the milestones, uh, it's, been, it's been a very, very long journey. It took over almost seven years starting from 2012, the first TV white space technology trials were done in the Western Cape in collaboration with CSIR, Google, and the others. That's where for the first time, the CASA issued the trial licenses, including provisional uh, type approval authorizations because the technology was still at its infancy. And then there were a lot of uh, 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 technical assessments that had been done. So in 2013, that's when CSIR now started developing a prototype for the geolocation spectrum database. In 2013. And then in 2014, there was another endeavor to perform more trials in respect of uh, access to TV white spaces. And then that trial was done again, CSIR, Microsoft, and others. And this one was in Limpopo. Now, in 2015, in collaboration with the research institutions, CSIR, University of Pretoria, and VETS. A discussion paper was discussed, was published uh, by ICASA, soliciting representations, oral or written, from the stakeholders. And then in 2015, <coughs> sorry, in 2016, ICASA, having considered the representations from the stakeholders, they published the findings document. 
And then in parallel, for the first time, the geolocation spectrum database that was developed by CSIR was approved by Ofcom for use in the, in the UK. I think uh, CSIR represented South Africa very well. Now, in 2017, based on the findings that were, were published in 2016, ICASA published now the position paper. In that position paper, it was, uh, it was sort of uh, agreed to say, now, in terms of dynamic spectrum, the best way to approach it to have a two-phased approach. One, let's look at the TV white spaces in the broadcasting band. Phase two, let's look at the TV white spaces beyond the, the, the broadcasting bands. So, in 2018, finally, because I published the regulations for TV white spaces, but the emphasis being on phase one, that is TV white spaces in the uh, television broadcasting band, in particular 470 to, six, uh, to six, uh, 694 megahertz. That's the result of what's happening today. So now, in 2018, when the regulations were published, the commencement date or the effective date of those regulations was not pronounced. Precisely because, as I've indicated on the architecture, there are certain elements that needed to be in place before implementation of those regulations. So to put the regulation in place, it has taken, in principle, South Africa seven years to come to where we are now. Sorry. I'm executive technology, but this technology is... In terms, like I've said, a press went to, to publication of the regulations. There were certain other deliverables that needs to be completed in order to implement the regulation. Whilst we were in the process of finalizing some of the components of that uh, architecture, which I've indicated uh, before. Between 2018, that is after the regulations were published, then ICASA started to put, uh, to put some of the missing uh, components or elements of the TV white space architecture in place. In 2018, uh, ICASA issued a tender for the development of the reference geolocation spectrum database. As I've indicated in the architecture, on top of there is a database system, which now we call that one the reference. So now we must put that in place, and then we'll need assistance in terms of hosting this particular uh, 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 geolocation uh, spectrum uh, database. So CSIR was the preferred bidder in terms of the procurement process. And then the tender was awarded to CSIR to develop now the reference 
uh, geolocation data, uh, database, and that was in 2018. In 2019, ICASA started to commission the top part of that architecture. And then it was hosted by CSIR. Now, in the process now, ICASA now started to open up further trials. But these trials now, in this particular time, is for pre-commercial trials. Stakeholders now, they must start doing some tests, some trials, to see if the TV white space uh, technology uh, can be uh, commercialized. So they were given that opportunity. No spectrum licenses uh, were required. And then subsequent to that, there came 2020, now COVID-19, national state of disaster. Again, ICASA opened up the use of TV white spaces without uh, uh, requesting additional uh, requirements. You didn't have to have a spectrum license. You didn't have to have a, a, a electronic communications license just to make it possible so that uh, it was during that time of the pandemic. So during that time also, we allowed TV white spaces to be utilized. Then by the end of 2021, then ICASA published and, uh, the effective date now. Now it says those regulations which were published in 2018, the commencement date now should be the 1st of April 2021. Now the ball is moving. Now, the implementation itself now. Like I've indicated, the reference geolocation spectrum database was commissioned in 2019. The CASA FEDA went on in line with the regulations that were, 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 were published. Now, to start to develop a framework now uh, for a secondary. If you remember that architecture, we are talking about the reference. The CASA now by 2019, they've got that in place. Now, the second component now is for the secondary ones. You needed ge secondary uh, geolocation spectrum database providers now. They can, that can play that role. So, the CASA published a framework in terms of how do you qualify them to be the entities that will provide the geolocation spectrum database services. So that framework was published and then a notice, you know, inviting prospective uh, geolocation spectrum database provider, providers to come in. So the only one or entity that applied for accreditation as a as a, as a secondary geolocation spectrum database provider is CSIR. But it must be noted that the invitation that was published inviting prospective uh, secondary base uh, providers, it's still open at any time. <laughs> if anyone is interested in becoming, fulfilling that role, it's open, they can do so. But to date, it's only a CSIR, CSIR who applied uh, and then who qualified uh, to be uh, the secondary uh, spectrum geolocation database. Now, in terms of that architecture, we've got the, 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 the white space devices. Now, ICASA had to put also a framework uh, relating to the, uh, the, to the white space devices. So, if ICASA put a framework in terms of type approval now of the devices themselves. Number one, for, 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 for safety uh, and electromagnetic compatibility. 
So there must be a framework now to ensure that those white space devices are safe to use and then they operate within uh, uh, the required pa parameters. And then they can operate without interfering the primary users of TV, uh, TV broadcasting band. So they mustn't interfere with the broadcasters. So that was put in place. Now the ball keeps on rolling. And, and then in addition to that, uh, CSR was designated to carry the function now of assessing compliance of those devices with the geolocation uh, spectrum uh, database, the secondary one. And then to make things simpler, uh, in the ICASA website there you'll find all the information that one needs to understand uh, about the TV white spaces, including the regulations themselves. You will find them at that internet uh, 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 Now, th this is very important. Now that we've got a secondary uh, data, a uh, uh, location spectrum database appointed, which is CSIR, you've got the regulations. You've got the reference geolocation database, uh, database uh, in place. That one uh, is managed by the authority, and the secondary one uh, by, by CSIR. Now, it's very important now. If anyone now wants to venture in terms of wanting to either deploy a network for TV white spaces or wants to provide a service utilizing TV white spaces. It's very important to understand and know what the mandatory requirements are for the use of TV white space in South Africa. Now, as a guide for TV white space, white space network deployment, Number one, it's mandatory. You must either have an electronics uh, communication network service license that allows you to construct, operate, and maintain this particular network. So it's mandatory uh, to, 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 to apply uh, to ICASA for this particular license. And then what's crucial again, you cannot use a white space device without authorization by ICASA. Remember, there is a type, a type approval framework in place to ensure that, that the equipment is safe. So you cannot utilize that until you apply it for that particular device to be type approved by the authority, which will require whoever is applying that, at least to produce a, com a, co a compliance certificate from any accredited uh, uh, test labs. That must be done. And you cannot utilize that white space device without being assessed by appointed or certified uh, secondary geolocation spectrum database provider. That's, that's crucial. And then in terms of the secondary spectrum database the itself now, like we've indicated in the previous slide that anyone can apply to be uh, the secondary geolocation spectrum database provider. And then I, I've indicated that still the applications are open now. <coughs> You cannot use the white space devices without being type approved or without the, the or, 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 or you cannot use it if it is not provided by a certified geolocation spectrum database or provider. 
And then lastly, because there is a difference between certain types of licenses that one might uh, require. The first one which I was talking about, say the ECNFS, it's merely for the construction, to construct, to operate, to maintain uh, that particular network. But a service can be provided by another entity. The other one is a network owner or operator is in this instance, and the other one might be saying wanting to provide uh, the services itself. So an ECS license is required, or at least you, you, you have to apply for an exemption uh, from, from ICASA so, so, so that you don't have to have that particular license. Sorry, uh, uh, in conclusion and way forward, like I've indicated, like I've indicated earlier on, to say based on our position paper, we said we're gonna go two phased approaches. The current regulations deal with phase one. Now, currently, as we speak, during this twenty. 22-23 financial year. Authority now is starting to come with regulations that addresses now the second phase in terms of TV white spaces beyond, 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 beyond. Currently, research is underway in, in terms of uh, DSA and emerging technologies. What is the target? The target is we want to come with another regulatory framework that, that goes beyond what we have now for phase one. And that one might even include, include the sharing of spectrum other than the broadcasting band. So in the, in the short and medium term, that's where we are going in terms of now trying to implement uh, phase two in terms of the position paper. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, program director. And, and thank you for affording me the opportunity just to share this my friends with you. I don't know questions if any any clarification questions uh, are welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Melo, for the very insightful seven-year journey that ICASA has had on phase one and two of South Africa Connect. I would like to welcome Ms. Priya from the FCDO to give us an overview of the FCDO's digital access program. day for technologists. <laughs> Thank you everyone and good morning and good
Good morning to the distinguished guests here this morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, among the technologists. I think this is a, a community of like-minded individuals and more excited that we have a number of representatives from the people who are actually doing the work in the communities here today. So uh, a very, very warm welcome to you. It is in your honor that we have this kind of event and we celebrate the work that you're doing today. Thank you to the CSIR for the opportunity to partner with you on this incredible program. And it's a great privilege to take a few minutes just to speak about the work that we do within the Digital Access Program. And also happy to have coffee conversations and, and take up your questions informally as we go. So um, why did the UK government start the Digital Access Programme? It responds to the simple problem statement, I think we're all familiar with this, which is that we re recognise the, the great power behind digital technology, the opportunity it presents, and especially the catalytic effect that it can have for inclusive economic growth and sustainable development. At the same time, we speak about the digital divide, uh, we speak about unequal access, and we recognize that when we speak about developing countries and emerging markets, we understand that there are barriers in accessing the benefits of the digital economy. And so all of these opportunities that we would like to see in the hands of our communities are compromised. And so it's with this problem in mind and this understanding of the barriers that may exist in limited or unaffordable connectivity, the lack of digital skills and relevant content and services, the limited trust and resilience that may prevent an individual from actually using a digital service that's been made available, and the environment that could foster digital innovation in a tech for good landscape, in a social impact landscape. So creating that kind of ecosystem for digital innovation to thrive might not always be there. And so that's the problem statement that the Global Digital Access Program tries to respond to. It does this through uh, country level programs in five countries, South Africa being one, uh, the other being Indonesia, Kenya, Nigeria, and Brazil. And so there is this network of, of country program teams that are working together to try and understand how this can be um, how this can be responded to, leveraging the network and expertise of local teams and working with the UK government expertise. There are four main ambitions within the program. The first is to try and understand models uh, that could enable inclusive digital connectivity. And that's why we're here today. So we um, consider and we partner with a range of connectivity models and we're trying to work out which can be successful to connect the unserved and underserved. Um, so it's a, it's a little innovative in that way and that it acknowledges that there's a level of experimentation involved and that it's, you know, it's not a seamless process and that we learn along the way, but, but along the way we're trying to develop feasible connectivity models. The other is to try to understand if we did connect communities that weren't connected before, if we did now bring the promise of digital connectivity to them and digital inclusion, how could we use this as a basis for a thriving digital ecosystem within these communities? How do we stimulate digital innovations within that community? We know that the needs is what creates the innovations and how do we stimulate that? And how do we create access to digitally enable jobs, digitally skilled jobs within that sector. There is also a policy ambition behind this. Um, the UK is in support of access to information, access to the internet, and so through the international policy work that we do, we're trying to promote those kinds of values in, in policy setting. We also recognize that wherever there is access to digital inclusion, there will be digital innovations giving rise to entrepreneurs. Uh, many of them sitting in the room today and, and many more still to come. And so if we acknowledge that there is this landscape of entrepreneurs that are being developed, how do we create access to local opportunities, access to markets, and how do we stimulate the kind of growth that this kind of entrepreneur can experience? The Digital Access Program works through what we call three pillars. 
the first being the models and enablers that enable connectivity. Um, and then on the back of connectivity, support digital literacy uh, within, uh, especially for vulnerable groups and especially for people who are uh, experiencing the internet for the first time. We promote this trust and resilience, not only by partnering with government representatives, uh, agencies that are working in security and developing capacity supporting um, the development of policy in that area, but also through cyber safety. So understanding that children accessing the internet for the first time may be exposed um, to certain harms on the internet and there needs to be intervention at that level as well. And then we also have the tech hubs. And this is where we support the digital entrepreneurship and digital innovation promise that can come from digital inclusion. So the digital access program in South Africa. The pillar one, models and enablers. The digital access program started out with a kind of business case development phase where we looked at the problem statement and sort of how the UK expertise can be leveraged. There was an inception phase and now we're in the implementation phase and we're actually towards the, uh, I would suppose, the, the climatic element of the implementation phase. And so there's been a number of highlights over the three years, but just last year, I think some projects that we were excited about on the systemic side, on the demand side and on the supply side, are some examples. One, uh, the project that we're here to celebrate today, the work that's being done by the CSIR, the work that we did um, responding to the COVID pandemic by supporting digital literacy for teachers. And um, over a thousand teachers were trained, uh, many from rural schools, but also presenting us with many learnings about what the needs are of those teachers that are working in communities, what the barriers are in terms of a digital literacy, um, uh, in terms of digital literacy learning and, and what the real needs are. And so leveraging that, we're going to be working this year on trying to develop norms and standards, responding to the needs and the lessons that we've learned from those communities. We're also working uh, with a range of partners um, led by NAMISA on a national digital skills framework for South Africa, answering key questions uh, such as how has the digital landscape changed over the last few years? What are the skills that we need? What are the pathways that we see? How do we involve the various sectors? And so we're very excited about that work as well that we think could have systemic um, opportunities. Pillar two, around our trust and resilience. Um, a range of interventions where we work with the various agencies. We do this through workshops, through think tanks, um, through access to various materials that might be needed to try and support local law enforcement, but also cyber awareness um, and skills development. Um, one of the real needs that was identified is just the vulnerabilities of SMMEs in the digital landscape and cybersecurity and data protection came up as a real barrier for SMMEs participating in that space with, um, with the risk that if they did not deal with cybersecurity and data protection, they could face risk of vulnerabilities to the business that could end up shutting down the business or compromising the initial users of a, of a new innovation. So for SMEs dealing with cybersecurity and data protection in a way in which it can be economized and the resources can be aggregated through toolkits and so on became really, really relevant. Um, and so we've got an excellent team, our cyber team, uh, both female uh, leading that team that are working with a range of agencies distributing these toolkits, but also using a dynamic process to assess and adjust how these toolkits can be developed. Um, there's also support that's offered for sectoral incident response teams um, and working together with agencies trying to understand how this particular landscape is going to evolve and what the needs might be for the certs. Um, and how UK expertise can be leveraged in that area. Our tech hub, uh, the South African uh, tech hub, the UK NSA tech hub, is one of uh, many tech hubs that are set up by the UK, um, and they are really trying to have a transformative effect on digital entrepreneurs um, through this network and um, creating opportunities internationally, including with UK firms. 
one of the needs that they diagnosed is that entrepreneurial skills, uh, sometimes soft skills, could also be lacking among uh, early stage entrepreneurs. And so the tech hub responds to that, uh, but also with a direct line to try and stimulate local economies. And this year we'll be thinking about how we stimulate township economies as well. Uh, a number of programs um, that are involved in uh, catalytic work either with female entrepreneurs, with angels that invest in South African tech entrepreneurs, uh, and then an aggregation platform to distribute as many resources as possible to, to tech entrepreneurs. Um, this is a quick snapshot of the kind of work that has been done over the last three years. 20,000 females that were trained, um, a number of convening events where people got to network and build partnerships, including with angel investors, um, a number of mentorship opportunities and a number of um, uh, SMEs across the digital uh, industries that are emerging, such as edtech, fintech, and health tech, um, that were serviced through the Tech Hub. Um, this is just some pictures from some of the events that they have. It's a very active and busy community of tech entrepreneurs, and you can follow their work through these links. And with that, I thank you very much for listening to the story of the Digital Access Program. Like I said, we're so open to lots of conversations, lots of coffees with everyone who wants to engage with the program and understand how we could partner and work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Priya, for a very comprehensive overview of what the FCDO does. I would like to welcome Mr. Luzang, Dr. Rather, Luzango Mpofu, Mfupe. So where is the technology? Hmm? How do I move my slides? It's not gonna come up there, you're just gonna do that. It's gonna come up there, you're going to use that. If that doesn't work, there's another one. This doesn't work. It should just point to that. This kind. Right, okay. Just move the paper to go forward. And then that's back. This one is forward. Before I did up here. Uh, good, good morning, colleagues. Uh, thank you for uh, honoring the event. I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, a number of uh, stakeholders, starting from the CSAR, uh, my manager, Karin, <laughs> uh, Moshe, uh, stakeholders from the industry, SMMEs, uh, and other digitaries. Uh, who have made it here, as well as the online uh, participant. So I'll be talking about the, the, event, the, the, the program itself, the accelerated uh, support program for SMMEs, uh, how it was uh, started, and how we have uh, been developing and the current progress and status. So this is my out outline. Um, so we look at the motivation, how, how, we, how we, we, we conceptualize the, the, the whole, uh, pro, uh, program, the background, uh, the, pro, the project itself, uh, the joint project with the FCDO. Uh, I'll give you a highlight of the beneficiary SMMEs, uh, the status and the impact so far. Uh, we'll look at the implementation uh, challenges, of course, all the projects have got challenges, as well as opportunities. Uh, then we'll conclude and uh, give a word of thanks to the stakeholders. So, a lot have been spoken already by the previous uh, speakers. Uh, the importance of broadband, uh, now we are talking about the four IR applications, uh, obviously, if you want to have uh, 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 universal 
access to four IR applications, we will definitely need uh, ubiquitous uh, broadband access to all the citizens. Uh, and as previous uh, speakers already mentioned, uh, uh, in, in most of the developing countries, uh, uh, the, World, the World Bank statistics says that 10% access to broadband can in improve the GDP uh, by up to 2.3%. So you can see why broadband is very important. Uh, if you look at the U United Nations develop uh, strategic uh, sustainable development goals, there are 17 of them, almost half of those SDGs, they are closely related to the access to uh, ubiquitous and affordable broadband from your education, uh, smart cities, uh, e-health, and so forth. So in order for countries uh, or nations to achieve the SDGs, broadband, broadband is at the center uh, of that. So you can see how important uh, the, the broadband access uh, to all the citizens is. Okay, so going forward, uh, we had the colleague from ICASA talking about the, the TV wide space. Obviously, that is the radio uh, frequency spectrum, which is a natural resource, very important for the uh, implementation of the uh, national ICT infra infrastructures. Uh, Utilization of the, of the spectrum, if it is not being utilized efficiently, obviously we'll have problems whereby operators can't uh, deploy their services due to maybe scarcity of spectrum, which at some point it can be artificial due to archaic or old uh, approaches in managing the radio resources. So the importance of, of uh, efficient utilization of spectrum uh, can never be overstated because without uh, access to spectrum, one will, will fail to, to properly deploy uh, broadband networks through the wireless uh, medium. Uh, so looking at, at the TV wide space itself, uh, since we already know that efficient utilization of spectrum is the key, we at the CSER started research uh, almost a decade ago on how we can efficiently manage the spectrum resources or assist the, the government in managing the sp uh, spectrum resources. And as, as uh, Dr. Chikwamba mentioned earlier, we developed some tools, and one of them is called um, Secondary Geocation Spectrum Database, which allows uh, network operators uh, to gain access to TV white space. Uh, obviously, most of you understand what is TV white space, the spectrum which is within the broadcasting uh, band in South Africa is uh, between 470 to 694. Uh, there are around 28 channels there, but most of the time those channels are not all the time uh, being utilized, uh, but with the technology that we have developed here, uh, we can enable the network operators to successfully utilize as a, on a secondary basis to provide affordable broadband services. So this is a, a network architecture or the framework of uh, a TV wide space uh, sample TV wide space network deployment. Obviously, our, our technology sits at the top uh, together with the, the system uh, from ICASA, the Reference Geocation Spectrum Database. And through that, uh, a network operator can access to, to the available spectrum at any given uh, area. Uh, TV wide space equipment can provide the last mile, or there can be a bridge uh, uh, to the last mile, uh, last mile can be uh, Wi-Fi equipment uh, or some sensors. Uh, so in the TV wide space uh, uh, ecosystem, there are a number of, of stakeholders, uh, as you can see. 
uh, you have device manufacturers or OEMs, you have network installers, data centers, uh, TV wise based network operators, uh, and many others. Our focus today is, uh, of course, the TV wise based network operators, but since this is a stakeholders uh, event, uh, I, I believe most or all of the stakeholders mentioned or shown in this diagram are here. Uh, I've, I've seen a number of, of OEMs already displaying the equipment outside, uh, data center providers and so forth. So it's a big um, ecosystem, it's a new industry. At the moment, this uh, uh, industry is mostly dominated by small uh, and medium enterprises. Uh, as you've heard from Brafil, from ICASA, uh, in South Africa, the regulations came into force just last year, uh, in April, uh, first of April. So operators and other ecosystem players, they're still consolidating themselves, uh, try to increase their output and, and productivity so that uh, the technology can be utilized uh, universally. Um, so, um, we are talking about the FCDO project today, but as uh, Dr. Chikwamba mentioned earlier, uh, of course the work started with the UNDP, United Nations Development uh, Program, in uh, 2020, 2021 financial year, where they supported, uh, we collaborated to support four SMMUs with the hard infrastructure. Uh, here we are talking about the equipment for the network, TV wide space equipment, Wi-Fi equipment, uh, support uh, the backhaul capacity to allow the internet to flow in their networks, installation, uh, building and back office. So the entire package uh, for uh, an operator to, to be able to start operating uh, was provided uh, by the UNDP among the four beneficiary SMMEs we are celebrating today. Uh, but that, that uh, project ended uh, uh, before the actual results started to, to show up. Uh, that's where we, we had an opportunity now to partner with the FCDO uh, thanks for your support, so that we can now uh, start to, to, to see the results through the monitoring and evaluation, ongoing support, uh, technical support, as well as uh, um, capacity building to, to enhance or to, to make the SMMEs uh, sustainable. So this is, this, this, as you see, uh, this is a partnership which is complementing uh, we have two key uh, stakeholders here, uh, all of them uh, supporting the same goal together with CSCR and other partners. So what are the objectives? Uh, so the objectives are, are all the same, to try to, to, to support the government initiatives to bridge the di digital divide, uh, to uh, support the initiative to, to uh, increase the digital literacy among the communities uh, because in some cases we find in the communities people have access to uh, broadband but they don't have that uh, literacy on how to properly utilize the broadband. Uh, of course to support the sustainability of the SMMEs because these are uh, businesses uh, they need to, to be sustainable in order to progress in their businesses and also to solve or to support the initiatives to create job opportunities among the youth, uh, women and persons with disabilities. Okay, so who are the beneficiary SMMEs? Uh, what are the status and the impact? Uh, as you can see on the map, uh, in phase one, we have four SMMEs who are beneficiaries. Uh, two of them, they are owned by women. Uh, they are youth as well, they are women and youth. And youth, it, uh, in terms of... 
<laughs> okay, youth boys or guys. <laughs> Nati and Songezo. So, um, uh, in Mdansane, uh, so we have Mdansane Mobile, it's from Mdansane um, Township in uh, East, uh, East London. As I said, it's owned by uh, uh, a youth, male. Uh, they are operational as we speak. They, so far, uh, uh, and I stand to be corrected because they will come and talk later. Maybe they've already uh, improved the, the statistics. They've already connected uh, six public facilities. Uh, public facilities here, we are talking about schools. It can be a tax rank, um, a library, and any, any, any facility that is uh, fit on that bill. Um, they've connected 10 local businesses. Uh, spaza shops, um, uh, internet, um, local internet uh, uh, stationaries. Uh, they've connected, last time we visited, they, I saw they've connected more than 281 households in the, around Mdansane and the, the job was moving very fast. They've created 10 job opportunities. Uh, uh, they have some intense permanent empl employment as well as uh, studentships. And they have 35 Wi-Fi hotspots around uh, Dansan. Um, Adnot from uh, Port Shepstone in KZN, youth owned, they're operational. Adnot has connected a number of facilities, as you can see, uh, 25 public uh, facilities around there, 40 local businesses, um, more than 164 households. Uh, they've created 15 jobs, intense, permanent, uh, uh, temporary laborers. They have more than 40 Wi-Fi hotspots, I believe, as we speak. Uh, Black Equation is woman-owned. Uh, they are based in uh, uh, Cape Town, outside of 40 kilometers outside of Cape Town, there's a, uh, a community called Ocean View. They're operational. They've connected the high school there, Ocean View High School. Uh, two local uh, spaza businesses are connected there. Over 14 households in the community. Uh, almost 12 jobs, internships, and so forth. And 14 Wi-Fi hotspots. So, it is very interesting. Their model in, 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 in um, uh, black equations, they place the hotspots within um, um, households so that they can serve two purposes as a hotspot as well as saving the particular household. That's why we, 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 you can see 14 households connected, 14 Wi-Fi hotspots, because the, the same Wi-Fi hotspots save other community members outside. And in addition to that, they've created two networks. Uh, they've got an intra, intranet for, for school children who can access uh, all the school materials without incurring any data cost. And the other network is the one which is they, they run it commercially. Kathabo uh, Tech is a woman owned from uh, uh, they are from uh, Bloemfontein, but they operate at Boshabelo in Free State. Uh, Boshabelo is, is around, I think, 55 kilometers from, from Bloemfontein. Uh, this uh, network is not yet fully operational. We are uh, still working with them to f uh, fix some few things, but the, the infrastructure is already in place whereby four public facilities are connected, most of them their schools, and I think one library. Um, they have one local business uh, connected, 11 households, six job opportunities already, those who are involved in installation and so forth, and 11 Wi-Fi hotspots. So, as you can see, our SMMEs are doing very well, based on the statistics in the short period of time that they've been in operation. 
Uh, so I'd like to share with you some of the, of the good stories. As you can see from the picture, uh, this was a visit to Ocean View with colleagues from FCDO, uh, engaging with the community members there at the school. Uh, these are some of the household connected uh, in Ocean View. You can see a Carlson TV white space equipment. Uh, of course, uh, their vouchers are very affordable. You can get a two round voucher in Ocean View. Uh, this is Adnot. Uh, those are the facilities that I, I mentioned. Uh, this is the chief, chief court uh, at the Kolo, Kwakolo. Uh, that's the STEM Center, Mavundla High School, and you can see the networks are also using uh, environmental friend uh, technology uh, of power. They are using solar. Uh, Dansane Mobile, uh, as you can see, they even got an operation center with call, call center. And so these are the jobs, the kind of job you're talking about. This is a lady, the lady at um, Dansane taking calls from clients at their call center and some of the uh, community households that are connected around the, the area. Oh, this is a famous picture with the... <laughs> His Excellency <laughs> uh, in Imdansane, uh, Songezo, Mr. Josh, I think he's... Uh, 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 Consul General in Cape Town for the uh, uh, British High Commission. When we visited uh, um, Dansane, one of their sites, uh, and Kathabo, this is the, one of the public facilities, the library, which is already, con you can see uh, the equipment there. That is a visit to one of the high school, I forgot the name, it we visited. Uh, the school principal. So, as I mentioned, there are some challenges when one is implementing uh, these kind of projects. <coughs> uh, we are all aware of the of the of the pandemic. Uh, thanks, Lord. Today we are we're even here without wearing masks, except for Albert. Oh, Albert. So the COVID uh, pandemic uh, caused a lot of delays, especially in the uh, procurement, because uh, most of the equipment are coming from overseas and the supply chains were disrupted uh, and caused some of the delays. Uh, the other uh, challenge uh, is due to the shortage of semiconductors. I think this is due to some political reasons uh, sanctions with some big countries. Now you can't get the chips to make this equipment. Um, also, uh, some of, of the beneficiary SMEs were not really getting good uh, support from the local authorities when they go to ask, ask for some support, which caused some of the delays uh, uh, issuing perm uh, permits and so forth, uh, as well as. Uh, limited availability of funding to support more uh, of the SMMEs. As you can see, it's only four in phase one. Uh, we, could wish, we wish we could support many more, or these ones maybe give, give them more support to uh, reach more areas. Uh, opportunities. So some of the opportunities, for example, for these beneficiary SMMEs we have today, <coughs> Uh, sorry about that. Uh, one can partner with them maybe to ex extend the reach of their networks to go further uh, deep in the underserved, uh, hard to reach areas uh, because these networks are scalable. <coughs> uh, you can utilize these uh, networks to, for example, to, to, to improve dig dig digital literacy among the communities or run all, or any of these government programs, supported programs, or uh, private sector programs, outreach in the communities. Um, there are some opportunities, for example, to partner with overseas OEMs to localize manufacturing of equipment, 
as you can see, one of the challenges here is uh, the semiconductor shortage and this uh, procurement because equip most of the equipment, uh, let's say 99% of the equipment is coming from overseas. So there's an opportunity for local industry to <coughs> localize, maybe uh, partner with OEMs to manufacture locally. Uh, <coughs> other opportunities are available right here at CSAR. We have a number of technologies um, that we can localize, to, we can license to SMMEs or any, any, any other entity, uh, which also can support the digital, um, uh, reducing the digital uh, gap. And also to collaborate uh, uh, to support more SMMEs. If, for example, uh, you, you know that there, there are some opportunities, why not collaborate? And we support more SMMEs. So in conclusion, uh, I don't want to repeat, repeat that. Broadband is, is, is an enabler of uh, anything for IR. Uh, and we know that we, are, we have a challenge. Uh, we still have a challenge. Uh, we need to bridge the gap. Uh, these SMMEs, once they're empowered, as I, I highlighted earlier, they can create a lot of job opportunities. Um, uh, there are some opportunities, as I mentioned previously, to work with CSR uh, or license our technologies. We can work with OEMs uh, to, to do type approval for uh, submission to ICASA to get your, your certification. Uh, partnering with SMMEs to expand, grow their networks. And uh, the issue of the global semiconductor shortage uh, is here to stay, and it is going to, to affect the uptake of digital uh, connectivity, the growth. So I'd like to thank you, uh, stakeholders who are here. There are many. And uh, I just tried to list. I know some of them, they, they skip my head, but uh, thank you, FCDO, for your support. UNDP, ICASA, Brafil, TIA. We work with TIA to, to uh, develop some technologies. The Department of Science, uh, DCDT, uh, the Office of the Premier, we know that uh, you are represented here today by Mr. Lindelani. Uh, BITF, I know you are here. Uh, PBICT, uh, wireless access provider of, of, of Africa, South Africa. Old Mutual Foundation, uh, VETS Business School. OEMs, I saw Keith and others around. The Moses Kotane uh, Institute. Rain Konyani Municipality in KZN, Smart Exchange, and any, anyone else that I've, I forgot to mention. Thank you. Kakul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mfupe. We will be taking a break and we will commence at 11.15. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back, Hello. delegates. We are about to commence with our second session. To our delegates that are joining us virtually online, we are about to commence. It is, could we kindly just settle down as we are about to commence with session two.
It is a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Fiseha Mukur Mukuria, the Chief Researcher at the CSIR, who is joining us virtually, who will be presenting. Thank you, Dr. Fiseha. Thank you. Thank you, Program Chair. Uh, there is an echo, so if you can uh, switch off your mics, it would be nice. Uh, hello, thank you. We uh, you thank you for joining, and I'm really happy that this stakeholder workshop is, is on, uh, and I'm really um, grateful for the work that uh, Dr. Luzango and the team uh, has, has uh, put up, and uh, also uh, I, uh, as uh, uh, you know, part of the team. We would like to welcome everyone, uh, uh, all of you, and the CSIR who has uh, really invested in this research, which is now showing its fruits by connecting as many, uh, you know, underserved communities as possible. Uh, so uh, I will start by by uh, saying that my presentation will be on spectrum innovation, on the the research that was behind. Uh, the, the the technologies that now are making you know strides in in uh, uh, in the rural communities and also in the research community where we are now watching that spectrum sharing is becoming a very important research area for the new uh, wireless networks that are upcoming. So the outline the outline of my presentation will be like this. Uh, I think um, uh, you can read it, so I'm not going to be, uh, uh, you know, reading it all for you all. But I think the most important thing is that the development of the spectrum sharing toolboxes that happened with the collaboration with the CASA uh, and uh, the proof of concept networks that were developed, it has resulted in in a technology that can be used to contribute to the digital transformation of the underserved communities. This is the main, the main uh, uh, message that I would like to share with you. So uh, one thing that is becoming very evident is the complexity of spectrum uh, allocation, which is also you know, uh, motivated because future wireless networks demand more bandwidth and we are getting more and more people connected to the wireless networks because of the flexibility of wireless connectivity you know doing your your business doing your uh, entertainment doing your health issues financial issues over a wireless network is a, the most you know uh, flexible way of doing things so more and more people are getting connected to the wireless networks so that requires more bandwidth that requires more spectrum so spectrum sharing is become will be in the future of wireless networks the base of future wireless networks you can see here some of the uh, you know the, the upcoming and the existing networks that are that are being deployed there's so many of them so the, all of them require uh, spectrum uh, allocation so uh, when we look at spectrum sharing, then there is a whole lot of possibilities of doing spectrum sharing. We can do frequency on, on fre based on frequency, so that people who who, who would like to you know provide uh, spectrum in in uh, in the area of uh, you know uh, the lower bands, you know the very high frequency bands, they can do it, and also they can share the spectrum with other spectrum areas, uh, with other networks, and and uh, uh, also the, the possibility of uh, doing uh, different type of services based on the same frequency, depending on the, uh, the amount of frequencies that you want. And also with time, you can do it also. There are services that are going uh, time-based, which implies that time can be utilized to make spectrum sharing possible. And space is already being used by many of the services, both the mobile and other uh, type of services. Our research is now going to be uh, making sure that we have, we have the, the uh, future of spectrum toolboxes 
and and the interference mitigation and uh, avoiding the scarcity of spectrum and creating more abundance in the spectrum sharing area. So our main aim in the future of the research is to use artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies so that we go beyond the TVY spaces band that has been allocated at present for dynamic spectrum access, but we would like to go to other bands also, and there are other bands also, which we will see later on. So how did we start with the spectrum sharing? We, we did data mining for underutilized spectrum during the first proof of concept works that we have done uh, at the CSIR in collaboration with the CASA and with industries like Google and uh, WAPA and the other uh, industry players, we could see that there is a whole lot of spectrum lying idle, despite the fact that the, uh, the normal regulatory authority has allocated this spectrum to TV broadcasters, there is still a whole lot of spectrum that is lying idle. So we said, why don't we build a network so that we can connect the underserved areas in, in South Africa, and we, we did a pilot and we showed the research uh, outcomes from that pilot, and that that made possible for ICASA to make the regulation. As, as Phil uh, from ICASA mentioned before, he, we we then came up with with uh, you know tools to make the regulation possible. So how did we build then the first uh, uh, spectrum database uh, for dynamic spectrum allocation? And, and that is made possible by the data that we got from the ICASA, the transmitter and receiver data that we got from ICASA. And we have also the ITU regulatory framework that is supported us to make sure that the interference levels are uh, minimized. And uh, radio propagation modeling, also ITU has provided that, and the terrain models for the different areas in South Africa. With that, we developed the Spectrum uh, uh, Innovation Engine, uh, that, that is a calculation engine that we have we have made possible. And we then connected with, with the TV white space devices, which actually are reconfigurable radios, because once they, they show any type of interference, then there is a possibility that we can reconfigure the radio to, to change the channels, because the available channels are several. So if, for example, ICASA comes up with, with a notice that there is an you know, a, a interference to the you know, primary user, which is the transmitters, the TV transmitters, then we can reallocate a new frequency and the radio devices have to reconfigure to that frequency. So what in the future we'd like to do is that we, we are doing a whole lot of data collection. We have spread our uh, modules in different universities in South Africa where we are collecting spectrum sensing data, which we will use now in the future for, for the adaptive spectrum databases and the intelligent spectrum databases that are that are coming. To, to, to start with, what we did was we worked with Ofcom uh, to make that to the to make the standards for the wide, wide space spectrum databases, and this is a framework that uh, uh, Ofcom UK has used, and we did uh, apply this to our database, and we we were one of the qualified uh, spectrum databases through the UK Ofcom qualification process. And this will help us now to, to design the future of spectrum databases which are adaptive and innovative and also intelligent to cater for the new wireless networks standards. So with that in mind, uh, I think this, this uh, thing has been uh, done uh, earlier. And, and uh, we have designed uh, uh, the re reference geolocation spectrum database. We have defined the, um, the resources can be found on this URLs, so you can go ahead with it and look at it. And there is also the secondary geolocation spectrum database, which is now supporting the rural networks to be 
you know, easily uh, compatible with with uh, with with the standard with the regulations that ICASA has come up, and and also provide the services for the rural communities to make possible for the rural, you know, uh, SMMEs. Uh, this type of planning of the networks. We have also defined a network planning tool, and we are now we have that tool also to be to be uh, licensed in the future. So we are happy that the UNDP and the uh, FCDO have come up with with funding so that we can roll out these networks in a commercial manner, in collaboration with the uh, rural SMMEs, which we believe will be the future industries enabling the fourth industrial revolution. So uh, to to make this happen, uh, we we have worked a whole lot with with uh, ICASA, with our regulatory authorities, with a number of other regulatory authorities. We have made it possible that that we have proof of concept network uh, deployment, which gave us the data that is required so that we can regulate put up the regulation, and we have also carried out a number of capacity building tutorials. To, towards uh, different uh, uh, regulatory authorities in in SADC and also in Ghana and and uh, uh, also in different forums like the ICT 4DA and the I3 the IEEE Africon uh, and we published a whole lot of research outcomes because you need you know peer review of your outcomes so that they are confirmed both from the IT, IEEE and ITU forums. So in the future, we would like to, to work also in the, with the standard, standards organizations so that we can get, you know, standards-based devices for TVY spaces. So you can get the, most of these resources on these URLs, uh, which we will share later. I think uh, Dr. Mufepe has uh, shown you this. Uh, one thing that, that, is, that was missing was that uh, the network itself uh, that is that is uh, you know uh, a very simple to to you know manage network so that rural SMMEs can have this work and the use cases that we are trying to make sure that happen uh, to happen is that we would like to see that for example rural clinics rural schools and client uh, uh, you know white space devices are put in the agricultural center and also in the in the next phase uh, after the four the first phase of the UNDP project we are going to plan to put up sensor networks so that we can make sure that we collect data for the agricultural center and then feed it back so that they can optimize their their crop uh, thing and and also the schools can also develop you know different type of services around that and the rural clinics can also benefit from that so our our aim is to develop a regional spectrum sharing framework uh, we plan to to make this happen uh, in the in the near future with the launch of the spectrum innovation uh, excellence center that we believe, uh, which I will talk later also on, on that. And we would like to, you know, sector the, the spectrum sharing framework uh, along the, you know, the SADC and the, uh, the uh, Eastern African communities and the Western African communities and the Northern African communities and collect the database so that we really need to have also, uh, you know, boundary on, on the boundaries. We need to harmonize some of the regulations that are that are there. And the African Telecommunications Union will be one of the stakeholders for this type of framework. So there are uh, already a number of spectrum sharing techniques that are that have been proposed, uh, very you know uh, seldom used in in, in my opinion. Uh, but the TVY space spectrum sharing now is making it you know uh, the, you know possible for others also to dare go towards spectrum access system. It's not only the TV wide space spectrum sharing, but the demands from the future wireless networks also entails that we need to have spectrum sharing techniques embedded in the networks as soon as possible. So in the future, we, we have this uh, type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, vision that we will have uh, 
uh, an intelligent spectrum sharing uh, man and manager database, which com which which can co include you know the LSA, the SAS, and the TVY spaces, and we will have ITU radio propagation models in the incumbents, you know transmitter uh, data, uh, which which will be there, and then we can identify the availability of unused spectrum anywhere in the spectrum bands and then be able to provide that in a way that reduces the the you know the interference uh, with coexistence algorithms which are based with artificial intelligence machine le learning techniques and we also believe that there's no network which is more than anything it's all heterogeneous wireless networks so it's a combination of different type of cellular wireless wi-fi uh, and other networks that will be there, but they will all be provided with the necessary spectrum uh, band and also with the necessary protection for them. Uh, I think this is mentioned a whole lot by Luzango. We have now already working uh, with with uh, UNDP and FCDO on four places in, in South Africa, and we support these uh, digital uh, rural entrepreneurs with capacity building seminars, network planning, and improving the digital businesses together with the, uh, uh, you know, WITS business school. And the, 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 some of the challenges that these uh, SMMEs are facing is that the, the monthly costs for the ISP services and the value added service creation that we are trying to support the billing and vandalism of uh, things and the likes. So we we also believe that we need to support these SMMEs as digital entrepreneurs because they are the ones who are now getting connected to the public sector. They are going to be supporting uh, their own sustainable businesses and also the, pri the private sector and the NGOs need to support these SMMEs so that they grow and become the industry that we are looking for. I think this TVY space value chain also it's, it's have been presented by Dr. Mufefe, so I will just pass it on. Uh, but there are a number of technology offerings that CSIR has come up now, which we would like to, to the, the SMMEs to, to, to be able to utilize and also, uh, you know, make sure that the CSIR also uh, gets the investments that 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 uh, on the research that they, that it has done. So we will be licensing some of them, and we will be working with the SMMEs also to enable them with different uh, f forms of uh, licensing and IP sharing. So my recommendation uh, for for uh, the future is that we need a center of excellence for intelligent spectrum management. Now that we have seen there is a whole lot of need for spectrum sharing uh, in different bands. And CSIR has shown that there are a number of award-winning TVY space spectrum toolboxes that have been developed through the research that, we, that CSIR has done. Then I believe that there is a need to have a center of excellence as a CSIR for spectrum innovation. And that will become, you know, a resource center for the communication regulatory authorities in Africa and uh, emerging economies in other areas also. And we also support the digital entrepreneurs that are now bud budding out in Africa and beyond. And we also would like to carry out network standards development through the IT, IEEE and ITU forums. And I think Dr. Mufupe mentioned to you that he is now working with uh, DICEPAN, IEEE DICEPAN 1900.6, where we would like to see that there are standards based uh, TV white space devices or white space devices, because now we are going up outside of the TV bands also. So we would like to enable accelerated digital transformation through spectrum sharing networks. We also would like to see that there is low power and green energy powered networks. I think Dr. Mufupe showed you the, some of the network nodes. We, have, we are powering most of the, the network nodes now with uh, green energy, like you know, solar energy powered uh, devices that we are putting, but there's a lot of demand from the networks 
that will grow in the future. And we would like also to carry out skills development because we see that both the communication regulatory authorities and the rural areas in, in Africa need a whole lot of skills, skills development to use these digital technologies for the benefit of developing their economies. So as I said, we would like to standardize this standards compliant TV wide space network equipment is very important. And we also would like to see because now that the, this technology is more, you know, applicable in, in uh, the TV wide space uh, radio equipment manufacturing should be happening in South Africa uh, because we have we, we see that there is a lot of market now within Africa that is coming. And we have seen that we are we are now uh, during the, the previous you know several years we have seen that this radio equipment manufacturing has stagnated is not improving their 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 uh, standards so we need to have a standards based one but we would like also to have equipment manufacturing so that we can create more jobs within south africa so in conclusion uh, we have seen that there is an increasing demand uh, for intelligent spectrum utilization in future wireless networks and there is a possibility we are looking at is that artificial intelligence machine learning techniques and the framework that i have shown you before so that we can have harmonization between the country boundaries could be done with the tv wide space regulations also and we would like to contribute to the digital inclusion and empowerment of underserved communities in africa and in emerging economies and we would like to see that these digital entrepreneurs like the Adnots and the Darthanes to grow and become an industry. Uh, we would like to see that, that this public and private sector collaboration become you know, more you know, uh, well established and so that we can support the value chains and enable efficient spectrum utilization for the nations, for the national authorities also. So addressing future wireless internet uh, intelligence spectrum allocation demand is something that the CSIR would, would do in the future. And we believe also that the Center of Excellence for the Intelligence Spectrum Management will be hosted at the CSIR. And I thank you all for the opportunity given to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mikura, for the very insightful Hello. presentation. It is my pleasure is to welcome Mr. Pleasure Peter Mello, the Mello. Chief Director of the Department of Communication Digital Technologies, who will be joining us virtually. Welcome, Mr. Peter Mello. Uh, good morning, everyone and uh, to all the honorable guests. Um, I hope the slides are projecting uh, the conference center. Uh, might to present government plan in terms of the SA Connect uh, program. Uh, <clears throat> I'll quickly talk to the background uh, regarding South Africa Connect look at the phase one overview and what is the phase two implementation approach that government is forging ahead with. At a high level, to share well, what are the financial implications regarding this program. And lastly, to talk on the integrated infrastructure. The background towards the same Connect, uh, you remember that cabinet approved uh, the South Africa Connect policy in 2013. Initially, it was breaking down into two phases, which was the first phase and the second phase. The first phase was looking at connecting these municipalities where national health insurance uh, program was being piloted by the Department of Health. It was therefore focusing on connectivity to government facilities in those selected district municipalities uh, which excludes Gauteng Province and, 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 and Western Cape, because they had uh, initiatives that were forging ahead in terms of connectivity within those NHI districts. The 
phase one was supposed to conduct around 6,000 uh, odd government facilities, which are your schools, health facilities, uh, libraries, home affairs uh, offices, etc. Unfortunately, due to the budget cut, we could only provide connectivity to the 970 government facilities, and the rest were deferred to the phase two of the program. The connectivity to those facilities uh, <clears throat> is defined as ratio of 10 megabits per second for the 970 government facilities, and it is anticipated that the upgrades will happen to 100 megabits per second and looking at the higher speeds of, or the higher bandwidth of 100 gigabits per second. Here is just the highlight of where we have connected in terms of uh, the, the phase one sites, which are the 970. Uh, the table below shows the breakdown in terms of the province and what our entities, which is broadband Infraco and CETA, did in those uh, provinces. Now, coming to phase two, <clears throat> cabinet approved the revised SA Connect phase two model and the implementation plan, which says that connectivity should look at providing, uh, I mean, should look at uh, prioritizing government, the, the remainder of the government facilities and also extending to the communities. The initial plan was to expand connectivity to what was not connected in the phase one. Uh, I think in the country we have a total of around 45,000 government facilities. You'll see it's just a drop in the ocean uh, uh, as we have connected Nancevit. So the remainder, which is for the 40,000 odd government facilities, was supposed to be connected as part of phase two. But uh, when the new minister arrived, she then relook and revise the implementation approach to say it should also be extended to communities or to the households. This approved model by cabinet will be based on the partnership between a uh, state information technology agency, which is CETA, uh, Broadband Infraco, TechTech, which is one of our <clears throat> uh, satellite and broadcasting signal distributor. And this will include other industry players or service provider, providers who will complement uh, the implementation of the project. The SA Connect project, the defined model or refined model, the phase two plan, will be implemented through three streams. Uh, that is, first one is the universal service obligation, where all the license holders of the high demand spectrum, which were auctioned recently, will have obligation to connect a particular government facility. So I think the next slides will show a high level uh, a, a figure in terms of what needs to be connected. And to look at expanding connectivity to the household, that is what we call the community connectivity. And lastly, is the government connectivity. Uh, uh, the rest of government facilities, which are schools, hospital, police station, and et cetera. Now, here is just a breakdown to, to say on a bullet uh, number two, to say the universal service obligation is targeted around 18,000 schools, 3,800 facilities, 8,241 tribal authorities. That needs to be connected by those who are in possession of the high demand spectrum that was recently auctioned. Uh, uh, engagements are currently happening with the regulator, which is ICASA and the department and the uh, project management office to 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 uh, um, allocate these numbers to those network service providers or mobile network operators the second stream which is referred to government it's where CETA will provide services to government facilities based on existing initiatives uh, we're looking at connecting around 14,000 government sites and and uh, providing new services to libraries, which are close to 1,000, including the community community centers that are called the tuition centers, uh, in line with the CETA mandate. Currently, CETA, in terms of the act, it's mandated to provide connectivity to provincial and nation and the, to, to national and provincial government sites. So this is it's just addition of what the CETA mandate in terms of the numbers. 
the way they are currently already connecting government facilities as mandated by the Act. So it's just an expansion of what they have been connected or upgrading services to sites which are probably connected with lower uh, bandwidth. Now, the third stream, which is the third leg, is for the broadband picture for NSET tech. To, to, to ideally look at providing connectivity to around 33,000 uh, communities uh, uh, through Wi Fi hotspots. And uh, this will translate to around 5,800, uh, I mean, 5 million, uh, 6 million households that will benefit from the connectivity of the sites. The number 840 base station is just a plain number in terms of the budget that we are currently which was provisionally allocated by National Treasury. You will see that it is not connecting the entire country, meaning the second component or the third phase of this program will have to expand based on the funding that will be available uh, from the fiscals. Uh, Robert Infraco and Centec has formally been mandated by the minister or by the department to run or to build the infrastructure on these particular communities. For now, they might talk about the Wi-Fi hotspots, which is an alternative, another technology alternative, but they will explore other alternatives, such as the uh, TV white space, satellite uh, connectivity, and, and other fixed, fixed uh, broadband uh, models that are existing. At a high level, they will see communities will have access to some sort of connectivity uh, as part of rolling out this phase. This connectivity, uh, communities that will be facilitated by the state-owned companies uh, BPI and Centre. Uh, they will rope in the ICT sector, the ICT industry, um, uh, on an open access principle. But what is more important is that <clears throat> there will be partnership that should enable small and emerging service providers or what we call them ISPs, SMMEs, the WASP, the mobile virtual network operators, to participate in uh, in, in, in this phase of uh, SA Connect. And, 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 and the minister has been clear that majority of connectivity or last mile connectivity should be done by uh, the SMMEs uh, or the ISPs or the smaller and emerging uh, companies. You'll be aware that the big operators such as your Vodacoms and MTN will, will connect through the universal service, service obligation, but more so to also piggyback on their infrastructure to minimize duplication. They, they, they are in the business of rolling infrastructure. Therefore, government cannot duplicate efforts. We will work um, hand in hand with them through various mechanism partnership so that we can leverage on what has been um, uh, uh, deployed on the ground in terms of the infrastructure. Um, Okay, moving on. <clears throat> so at the high level, we are saying the total uh, capital expenditure required to build these community networks, including extending connectivity to government facilities by CETA, is around two, uh, 2.5 billion. This is the amount that National Treasury originally allocated to the department uh, to, uh, for, for the next three years. Um, it is a, it is envisaged that through partnership with the private sector, we might see uh, streams coming from private sector uh, uh, complementing government in terms of the 2.5 billion that we are planning. It's, it's, uh, uh, the, the study that we conducted talks about 40 billion to connect the entire country in terms of infrastructure, not the OPEX. So for now, we, we are working around 2.5 uh, billion. What, what the plan is to ensure that the existing budgets that government department has can be centralized so that we can maintain uh, services that we will have provided through the initial payments. So the idea is that we are only going to build infrastructure and the end users, which are the beneficiaries, your schools, Department of Health, uh, Home Affairs, Education, uh, should therefore utilize their existing ICT budgets to support and maintain those connected sites. Uh, we'll be aware that in the country, and I think the presentation that were made earlier, 
and also that will be coming up by the SMEs in the next session, will show that challenge is sustaining the connectivity once the network is in place. Therefore, it is empirical also from government that we request those beneficiaries to start prioritizing their ICT budget to ensure that connectivity sustained in those uh, uh, you know, um, uh, government facilities, your clinics, police station, and such. So the discussion are currently taking place between the respecting accounting officers uh, uh, from, 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 from uh, the national, we'll talk about ministers, and from the provinces, engagements are happening through the office of various premiers and MECs to see to it that there is budget that is set aside to maintain and, 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 and support services that they all have been collected through uh, this 2.5 uh, billion. Uh, initially, that is the challenge that we have been experiencing as government, where connectivity happens, but at the long run, no one is really maintaining and, 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 and uh, 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 managing that particular connectivity. So now the new approach is saying, let's work together as government. Let's engage with our municipalities, local government through COCTA, to see what, where can we tap in into this particular budget to ensure that those 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 Wi-Fi hotspots that will be provided to the communities are also sustainable. We therefore require local government to come on board and tap into their budget to sustain uh, uh, those connectivity. Um, I think this is my last slide, just at the high level to show the, how the integrated infrastructure we are looking at. We are saying nationally we will have your Centex, CETA, Broadband um, uh, Infra uh, participating in terms of uh, the infrastructure, the current infrastructure, the plain infrastructure that they have. But more so, we need to look in other non ICT state-owned companies such as your ESCOM, PRASA, Transnet, um, think on higher education, we, we might look at your Sunrem to see how we can utilize the infrastructure that they have invested to support us in ensuring that we achieve our ob uh, objective of digital divide, especially with the minister who has put stringent, stringent uh, target to say within three years, by the end of this uh, administration, which is 2024, this project should have made serious positive impact and connected the communities that we have planned. So we, we, will, we will also pick it back on the municipal state-owned network. We will also, as I've indicated earlier, engage with the private uh, telcos network infrastructure to ensure that we minimize duplication. But in terms of dri driving this SA Connect uh, model, our state-owned companies are, have been tasked to do so. Similar to the phase one, they, it was driven by the state-owned company, which is CETA, Broadband, Infraco, and Centec. I think this is my last slide in terms of the overview on the SA Connect. And I would like to thank uh, the CSIR for inviting the department uh, to share with um, the audience and the respective stakeholders in terms of what are the plans that we are having uh, with regard to connectivity or the objective of bridging the digital divide. Uh, I hand over to you, Program Director, and thanks uh, to everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Millo. It is finally time to welcome our beneficials of the project, the SMMEs. The CEOs will be highlighting the difficulties, the positivities regarding this project. The first one that will be laying the playing field is Mr. Mbele of Ednotes. Through the Youth Fund in partnership with EDTA, the Office of the Premier funded Ednos to obtain an ICASA license and telecommunications equipment. Business has further attracted other support from the private sector, including the Old Mutual Foundation, the UNDP, the Smart Exchange, just to name but a few. 
The successful partnerships have made it possible for Ednodes to roll out public Wi-Fi and TV wide space hybrid network. Ednodes is a 100% black youth owned business funded by Mr. Natin Bele. We are a broadband technology solution provider that is also licensed by ICASA. We provide wireless broadband access to hard to reach rural and marginalized communities in need of connectivity. We are expanding TV wide space based hybrid networks nationally by integrating value added services that target the rural and peri-urban underserviced market looking for affordable telecommunications access. We are a member of the Internet Service Provider Association and a member of the Wireless Access Providers Association. Ednotes upholds the ISPA Code of Conduct. We serve to both private and public sector community Wi-Fi hotspots. The commissioning of Ednotes TV white space in Guazulu Natal forms part of KZN Premier. Sikhe Zigalala's aggressive plan to implement broadband connection and digital transformation that will enable effective deployment of OIR solutions. As the Premier pointed out during the SOPA, our taxi ranks, schools, public facilities and health facilities are a cornerstone of the broadband rollout. Ednotes has deployed close to 50 public Wi-Fi hotspots between Itagini and Ubu district. This event is a demonstration that the 20,500 by 2024 Wi-Fi hotspot is a target that is possible. This rollout is a good model for the whole country to learn how the private and public sector can partner to support innovators like Nati Mbele from our province as they build businesses with international impact. We salute the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research for entering into a partnership agreement with the United Nations Development Programme and supporting Ednotes to bridge the digital divide in South Africa. It's encouraging to also learn about Ednotes' partnership with the Old Mutual Foundation. As the government of KZN, we are exceptionally proud of these partnerships because it enables us to practically live our purpose, growing KZN together. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a heavy toll on the economy of South Africa, leading to a rapid increase in the unemployment rate. Interventions by the government such as direct fiscal support for tax breaks to SMEs are shown to support business continuity, including being able to afford access to broadband internet, which is vital to promote their online product. However, the high cost of data and internet access remains an obstacle for many businesses to move towards digitalization of operations, as well as gaining access to online financing and services. Thus, provision of affordable internet access, particularly in rural areas with limited digital infrastructure, is expected to play a real role in South African economy recovery by enabling SMEs to shift towards digital operations and enhance access to markets, finance and services that are required in a post-COVID-19 economy. Thank you. Uh, good day. You know, after witnessing challenges with all the technologies this morning, I realized that I'm not going to do any PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so, uh, yes, my name is Natim Bele. Uh, we're based in Pochepstein, and uh, I'm really excited to share this journey with uh, CEO Songezo from Tanzania, CEO uh, of uh, Katabo Lerato. CEO of Black Equation, uh, Susan, and this chain would not have been possible if uh, it wasn't for CSIR, uh, because I want to really emphasize something which the country, I feel, we are missing. We've got so much research that is sitting in shelf, catching dust. However, CSIR, with its inverse space, they've shown that commercialization is the key in addressing challenges that the country is facing right now. So, Ednot was privileged to be selected to be part of this program at the beginning of 2020. And the, you can imagine, we got our license from ICASA at the eve of the lockdown on the 26th of March, 2020. 
Now, starting an ISP during COVID, trying to source equipment, trying to do site visits with the country being on lockdown, I don't want to go further to emphasize the challenges that we encountered. But with CSIR coming on board, and we were also privileged you know, to be in KZ10 where a broadband connectivity is being prioritized. Hence today, we have Mr. Mbambo being sent by Office of the Premier to continue to show the support because in the midst of their challenges, the Office of the Premier came on board to say, here are the equipment uh, on top of what CSR has, has already delivered. So leveraging on our network, we further contacted on Mushwar Foundation, which I really want to recommend because one of the things that we underestimate when we give entrepreneurs equipment, you know, they, there are issues of working capital, getting from point A to B, which on Mushwar really came on board for us to cover this aspect. But also further, our local municipalities was quite supportive at the beginning, and even right now, Rengoyeni municipality. Because, you know, to deploy these infrastructures, you need to negotiate with the council to get the land. You know, the land question, I know, is uh, one of the issues, one of the biggest elephant in our room. So even one of the challenges that we encountered to get the land to put towers we managed to negotiate with the municipality, do a value exchange. Hence, when you see all our traditional costs being connected, we negotiated that give us the land to put tower, we'll connect your traditional authorities. So those are some of the partnerships which, are, are, in my opinion, I feel we need to learn from. And I'm so privileged to speak after Peter, and I think even Peter is the luckiest man one of his problems to spend that 2.5 billion. <laughs> we, I'm really, I hope he's still on the call and he, he can see five, uh, four individuals, uh, four companies that are, are willing to assist him. You know, 2.5 billion is a lot of money, so we can assist him to, to spend that money. <laughs> yeah. So if you look at our video, I want to really emphasize the issue when we build this business, there are five issues which we really felt uh, as a company we really need to uh, take into account. The issue of uh, the infrastructure, of course, with uh, CSR work on research on TV space, as well as the support of, from ICASA. I must really recommend our regulator. In Africa, some of the regulators are really struggling to understand how to come out to regulate civil space. So with ICASA coming on board and their willingness to really engage I, small businesses like ours, uh, we, we really recommend uh, ICASA's work. Uh, so the infrastructure that we brought into uh, our network, we have to make sure that it, 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 it's something that can resist you know, conditions in KZN. I'm sure you're aware. We've got two seasons, summer and summer. So that's on its own. If you deploy a technology, you need to make sure that it caters those conditions. TV space is a perfect fit for our province, as well as, 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 as the country as a whole. But also, you know, I know there are a lot of, uh, you know, inspiration from telecoms. They always claim they cover 99% of the whole country. Look, I, 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 I do not dispute that, but the challenge is, is that coverage affordable for someone on the ground to get access to the internet? So we want to make sure that when we build our, our, wife, our wife house spot, they also become affordable and accessible. Another biggest issue that we encountered, the content as a whole in South Africa, which, uh, again, Peter, I'm sure you'll take that into account. You know, the content that we are consuming is hosted out of the country. We consume YouTube, we consume Facebook, and all Netflix. You know, where the co content is hosted and where it's consumed, the longer the distance, the more it's costly to consume that content. 
So as a country, we also need to look at how do you bring the content to where end users are located, but also how do you create our local content which is relevant to our uh, market. So some of those issues, hence we pay a lot of money on Microsoft products because Microsoft is hosted in the state. They own the, uh, the IP. We, we pay a lot of money to consume uh, Netflix. So we want to see, we are engaging even content creators to host their content on this network. Even with local municipalities that we engage with, one of the solutions that we provided with Umzuma Municipality, who is our client, is to make sure that their backup run between Umzuma Municipality and our local district, which is Ugu district. But also, our people, you know, even, I'm actually one of the, um, I'm one of the, I can admit, I thought internet was Facebook, you know. So, you know, that skill to understand what really, what you can do in the internet, we need to empower people to also be aware that in the internet you can participate on online trading, you know, you can open an online shop. It's not only just going there to be on social media, uh, or you can be on social media but be productive. So, which I, you know, this one, which is a partnering with a local based uh, uh, partners or authorities, it's critical because this equipment, you want to make sure that once they've been, they've been deployed, they are secured. So there's no better way of doing that than bringing in the local authority, getting um, local municipalities involved, but also get the buy-in from the communities. Not doing just those uh, desktop exercises, but employing people from that area. So, uh, I mean, in my opinion, if we can address these five, these five things, the issue of infrastructure, the content, affordability and accessible, digital skills, as well as partnering with local-based uh, partners. So with that, I would like to thank uh, uh, Gabriel. I know he came to our launch in KZ10 from the British Commissioner, and I know he's, uh, he's the one who signed off for, for the bill as being here. <laughs> yeah, but also really, appreciate CSR team, you know, uh, I, I don't know how many hours we spend with CSR team. I've seen Cleofas, Alpedro, I know who talks of size online. I've seen uh, other colleagues. Uh, guys, you know, please bear with us uh, as entrepreneurs. Sometimes we, uh, we can be, we, you know, uh, wanna hit some numbers, but you know, the issue of uh, Tapping into the skills, you know, uh, CSIR. Look, with Ednot at the moment, I mean, I always say we don't have to spend any money on R&D as long as we've got partners like CSIR. <laughs> so I'm really grateful for able, I mean, being able to leverage on those, on those uh, partnership. But also the issue of private sector, we always uh, believe that, you know, only government can address these issues. But in South Africa, we, we, we have a, a, a big, a big uh, pool of uh, uh, people that can do a huge difference if they can interact with us. Of course, the risk of, uh, they always say it's a risk to work with SME, but I think today it's a sign that we as SME, we're not alone. We've got so much people that are backing us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nati. I would like to welcome the CEO of Black Equations, Mr. Hanif Manuel. Um, I'm Susan Khrupis, um, Director at Black Equations, and... Okay, I'm Hanif Manuel, 
good day, everybody. Uh, first of all, we want to thank you for the opportunity this afternoon. Um, on that note, I want to start. I want to start at companies, if I can mention, um, companies like Telcom, Vodacom, MTN, Celsi, um, they've all be, done a remarkable job creating or connecting our people. Um, we know there's a lot of negative remarks um, that is being said about these uh, big companies. Um, but those are mostly coming from people who have never created or built anything themselves. As a community network, we marvel at what they have achieved this far, and we see the information and communications technology have done and for, communi for communities locally and internationally. The question we now pose to everyone here today, um, what will it take for South Africa to connect its people who got left behind due to financial constraints? The question we have been wrestling with for the past four years uh, is not how do we pay, how do people pay but how, or rather, how do we let people pay? Uh, supporting a project like ours is not easy. <coughs> Due to the nature of inception, our network started out as a research project with the University of Cape Town. At the time, Ghanif's core function as a community act activist was developing a stable food system for Ocean View and a local voucher system was identified as part of the solution to give, give value to this underutilized resources currently treated as waste. For this, we needed a digital network to facilitate many small transactions, but data was expensive. As proud South Africans and members of the Ocean View community, we've come to realize a long time ago that no one is going to solve our social economic issues, that no one is going to come and help us if we don't do it ourselves. And we've been working very hard with what we have to build our community. Ocean View, ladies and gentlemen, still does not manufacture nor produce anything yet. And we still have a lot of improvement to make on our network. Many days we struggle, and we, do, we don't know <laughs> which way in these uncertain times. But we push forward because this network is the backbone of our social economic development for our community. With that said, I just want to play a quick video.
for me, lastly, the problem in low-income in, uh, low communities, low communities, low communities is directly related to the value a community contributes to education. And that is where I come in as part of, as a director in the business. Um, the part is the education. We in Ocean View, we have got the business in Ocean View. We don't, our core function is not just to take from the community, but to give back to the community. My main, or I think my huge passion is the education part, and in partnership with Ocean View High School, what we do is to assist the students with free internet access to access the content on the website that is uploaded by all the teachers at the school. Uh, but for every child at Ocean View, be it start at grade eight, all the way right through to, to grade 12, is to have them get access so that they can um, access the schoolwork, school content, and a huge problem in Ocean View is there's no money for data. Uh, it's huge for, uh, for a family to use their last 30 rand that they could be spending on bread or milk, whatever, to give to a child to sit um, on the internet and to get access to apply either to universities. That was one of the big problems that we do know, I know it for myself growing up in the community, um, if you don't have the resources. So now we want to create a platform where there is no excuses. We're giving the guys or the students free access to do applications so that I want to see in the community annually if there is five students who matriculate and go to university or apply at least to a university, it's a lot. So if we can get more students who's got access, now there's data to apply to universities, that is the aim or my goal um, with this whole project. Thank you. Okay, we're not done yet. <laughs> All right, so. When we started this project, right, um, a big focus for us was on education. Um, Ocean View's got a lot of socioeconomic challenges, and we believe that a people that cannot unite by blood can only do so in, on education to solve their socioeconomic challenges. Right. Oh. Two things. Yeah. Okay, so number one, Ocean View community. Ocean View is a small community, right? It's 40 kilometers outside of the city of Cape Town. It's nestled at the foot of a mountain. Um, and I think in 2019, when the city of Cape Town uh, rolled out the fiber infrastructure. Um, a community like Ocean View was skipped. A community like Masipumalele was skipped um, because the community doesn't have an economic value, right? Um, so when lockdown came, our kids were roaming around. Um, even our teachers weren't prepared. And I was a teacher at that time at the school as well. Weren't prepared for what happened. Um, our kids, our kids, our children's education was stagnant for that couple of months. Um, we struggled to get um, schoolwork out to the kids, right? But in our neighboring communities, education continued. Um, and again, um, for a community like Ocean View, we were left behind. Right? But we're also not saying that it's everybody else's fault. There's a lot of it that is our own fault as well. Okay? Um, population. We've got a high unemployment rate with a high population growth that is unsustainable. All right? um, and when we look at our infrastructure, there's a slow development of infrastructure that is enabling economic development and entrepreneurial behavior. Um, Access to connectivity is expensive. 
the East uh, Telcom, the East Vodacom, the East LC, the East food in the shops as well. But if you don't have money, you don't have access, all right? Um, uh, even though there's a high cell phone penetration rate within our community, um, grade eights, I was shocked, right? In 2018, when I started teaching at the high school, I was shocked. 14 year old kids, you put them in front of a computer, some of them don't know how to switch it on, let alone the at button or what the space bar is for. Don't know. Uh, up until in 2021, all right, still where I found students uh, that don't know how to operate a computer. Cell phone, easy to use. Cell phone penetration, penetration in the community high, um, but when it comes to a device like this, then they don't know, right? So in Ocean View, we're experiencing low levels of digital literacy and the monetization of internet access. If you are paying 700 rand a month for um, an internet access, that's an investment and you should be getting a return on your investment. But for us there, most of our people, it's Facebook, it's YouTube, uh, um, it's WhatsApp. Then you don't, then they don't know what to do with it anymore, all right? Even at school, uh, there's computers there, there's a lab there, I give the students access, there you can go. Um, then, then they start, YouTube, Facebook, um, some of them WhatsApp. But um, after 10, 15 minutes, then they don't know what to use the access for anymore. Um, education is not considered as a vehicle out of poverty in my community. High school dropout rate, we're looking at 49%. Entering uh, grade eight, we're looking at 300 to 310 students coming in um, at the school. Matric, we're looking at 180, uh, 160 to 180 students. All right, the rest just fell out. Um, they now in the community, uh, joining the gangs, mugging, robbing, um, not knowing what to do with their lives. Uh, market access. Informal traders, there's about uh, 200, 250 house, or house shops in Ocean View, all right? And none of them advertise. People don't advertise. Uh, to have flyers print is expensive. Even though just around the corner, uh, a bread is maybe two and cheaper than what I'm paying at this house shop here, but I won't know until I get to that house shop, all right? So informal traders does not have market, um, nor advertise their businesses. And even those who, who do start something, um, they struggle to get access to the markets where they can actually sell their products, all right? Uh, this is up, down, okay. And at Black Equations, we have learned that we cannot change the minds of people. You can't change them. It's very difficult. All right? um, if we want to encourage economic development through local entrepreneurship, we have to change the environment by giving people a platform that makes this type of behavior easy for them to perform. A simple example is the seating arrangement here. All right? Okay, this you can't move around now. Uh, but you'll find that um, people will enter and people will conform to the environment that is already set for them, all right? Uh, maybe you don't like sitting like this. Maybe it would have been better if uh, we were all facing that way. But because the room is set like this, we conform to the environment. So fighting against people's mindsets, um, we've learned we're wasting our time. But with our network, we can use this to change the environment, and by that, influence the outcome that we are looking for. It's easier, less energy, less fighting also, right? So, firstly, at Black Equ uh, what we do, we engage with the community, we listen to their challenges, they propose solutions, and what they need to use the internet for, okay? Then, here is also when we learn about the socioeconomic challenges to get a better understanding 
for developing a service to be used by them. It's pointless you building software programs that people aren't going to be using. Right? From here we build the infrastructure with software applications to meet the express needs of the community. With our Beyond School Borders program, our target market attends public schools that are often overcrowded. Between 50 to 85 students in a classroom. I've experienced this all right, uh, in a classroom. This leads to low levels of comprehension and very little learning taking place due to the poor learning environment. A teacher is spending more time on discipline issues than the actual lesson. All right. But what if we tell, tell you on our network, educators can pre-record their lessons in any digital format, upload it to a server, and our children can download this content free of charge anywhere on our network. At hotspots or private home installs, extending the classroom beyond the borders of the school. Only through education, we will resiliently develop our hyper-local economies and create more employment from within that will set us on a path of production and manufacturing. And black equations will form a crucial part of the economy built on our network called Focus in Oceanville. Or at least this is what we believe. Okay, then step in. Step in. Oh, yes, that's the one, Morris. Tell me. Tell me if, uh, if you have a special head now. Okay, so, okay, so, okay, so, okay, so, okay. Hi, my name is Sarah Ocean View Secondary School. Um, all my, after high school, I aspire to become a lawyer. So next year, I will be studying law. I live in Masipumelele, a great community full of support, full of um, actually quite successful people that come from Masi. So when I, when I leave Masipumulele, I want to be one of the people that actually represent Masipumulele, one of the people that um, do go back and give back to the community because what actually builds a person is where they come from, how they were brought up and always giving a value to where you come from and acknowledging that. So that is where, where that's where my head is at. However, um, as a grade 12 learner, being able to do schoolwork, accessing uh, work, uh, especially because of uh, the pandemic that has affected us from coming to school, we now uh, had to study online. Um, so that has become an issue here and there simply because of um, data. Uh, however, I do believe that the INETI um, hotspots will then help us in terms of being able to, to, to access the work and do the work on time and, and not miss out, especially as grade 12, now that everything is in a rush, we all have to be um, 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 quite informed to or prepared to write our, our final exams. So, so when you are able to access your schoolwork freely, you are actually also motivated to, to actually do the work and go as far as you can in terms of our careers and our future.
ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen on the infrastructure, on the infrastructure, infrastructure that we will support it with, there's three networks co-locating on it. It's Focus, it's Ineti, um, and then there will be another network that will be starting soon. For two youngsters. All right. So, this was three, three doctors. All right. Um, and Inet is one of our partners, uh, whereby our network is split into two sections. A part of it gives access to internet, and then another part is basically just a big intranet, all right, that uh, is extending throughout the community. And on this intranet, we can upload any content, and we use this for educational purposes. Um, and then our students at the hotspots, anywhere within our network, they can access this content. So the plan here, or the idea behind this year is the educator can focus on the broader lesson, all right? You've got 50 students in class, 80 students in class, all right, where you can't get to all of them. Some of them, they, they haven't even heard what is going on. But when you're sitting at home or wherever you are, you've got a video lesson, pause, play, pause, play, pause, play, until you, you understand, all right? You know, teacher, hey, I just told you now. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, um, and then the student, where the student has a learning barrier, can then come to the educator. This is where I'm stuck at, all right? So that is the idea behind it. Um, but then last year we were introduced to light bulb through this program as well. And we've got students registering now um, on this platform. Right. Um, they started last week, Friday, I think. Yeah, they started. So, and one of them came to me, and he said, "That light bulb platform, sir, um, it's Quayman. <laughs> yeah. um, this is how we talk there, right? Um, so, moving on." Down. I'm clicking, sir, but okay. So, with everything that we had, and with all the work that we were doing, we were also struggling. We know what we what we had to do, what we need to do, where we want to be, right? But it's not easy when people are just volunteering, right? Um, so. With the support we got now, um, our platform is a lot better, all right, um, and easier, okay? No, this is not the right slide. No, back. <laughs> Another one? Okay, yeah. So now, our platform is much, much easier. Once logged onto our SSID, users are redirected to our captive portal. Here, they can choose to access the internet or our local uh, um, connect portal, of which is the intranet. It is affordable. Internet access is granted through the integrated one for you voucher system on our Focus Connect product line. Users can thus easily access one of our affordable internet packages at the local nearby house shop. Right? Um, we we don't have to deal with the cash, okay? We've integrated with one for you. People go to the house shops as per normal, um, where they, uh, they spend the cash and they buy a one for you voucher. Once they are in one of our hotspots, uh, they type in the, or enter the, um, their voucher code, um, and then they will pick or select what uh, uh, amount of voucher or internet access they would want, all right? And we're talking about from one rand, one rand for half an hour, two rand for an hour, all right? Everybody here, two rand, here run. We know this, no? the guys at the shop. Uh, so people have got one rand, two rands in their pockets. When you don't have a lot of money, you're earning between 3,500, 3,200 rand a month. Um, a 50 rand is a lot of money, right? 
Um, affordable advertising. Remember what I said about the house shops, all right? So printing flyers are expensive, and the main reason behind informal traders not advertising their products. The only time you get to know their prices is when you ask at the shop. Our website is also a listings page where informal businesses can advertise across our entire network um, affordably. Our Beyond School Borders program sees the community students access their digital high school content from anywhere in our network. This means when video lessons are recorded by educators, students can still continue with their education from home and at their own pace until they understand. With a broader lesson covered in the video lessons, more classroom time can be dedicated to learning barriers faced by the students. All the student needs to do is go to the nearest hotspot connect and download the educational content at no cost to them. It is also rewarding, right? So every time the community spends their money with us, they also know they are directly contributing to the education of the community's youth and supporting local economic development consciously. We use the monetary support to also give back to the community through free and affordable advertising, boosting the local economy on top of the education. Hmm? Rusty, no. I, I'm not sure if I'm clicking. Okay. Uh -huh. So, with the one for your digital voucher, it's customer convenience and local business support. Every time they buy a voucher at one of those house shops, uh, they earn a percentage of that money. So in that way, we are also supporting all of those house shops. Okay? Affordable connectivity to bring new economic opportunities. All right? Uh, to, for the market to transact as a consumer, or a merchant on our platform, opening new marketing opportunities by connecting businesses and the clients. Uh, people don't know what uh, uh, those small businesses have to sell. Right? An energy exchange of value can now be given to underutilized resources treated as waste. All right? A lot of people, they've got a lot of stuff laying around at home that they are not using, it's just sitting there. Sometimes people are even throwing away clothing Right? So on our platform, they can advertise these things. Community is now beginning a new phase in their development, utilizing business practice to build and solve their socioeconomic challenges resiliently. Uh, next slide, please. I, I don't know how this thing... All right, so 48%. Of our households in Ocean View earns less than 3,200 rand a month, right? But we find that within our households, there's an average of three mobile or smart devices, okay? Um, and then also on our network operating, um, we've logged about just over 6,000 unique devices on our network. Next slide. Then. 2022, so our system has been upgraded, uh, staff have been trained, um, signing up, so we're still working on signing up all informal traders within the community, um, we're working on getting a company per vehicle, we're using our private vehicle at the moment, and then we are busy saving up for the ECS and ECNS license, right? And then we are looking forward to expanding into another community. And for next year, God willing, develop a better website, open an online store, and again, a presence at Taraku as well. Next slide, please. All right, yeah, that's the end of it. Sorry, I know it took a bit long. But we just felt that this was important for us to share. Thank you very much. Sir.
Thank you very much, Susan and Hanif. It is now a pleasure of mine to welcome Lerato Rampama, who is the CEO of Katabo. As she's making her way back here, or rather in front here, it is an it is an, a great opportunity because she is not just female, she is also under the demographic of youth. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you could just please give me a moment. My laptop does not want to cooperate. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, yo, my, my, my colleagues from EdNote and Black Equation has set the bar very high for me. I mean, um, I'm sure uh, my slide is going to be <laughs> the shortest ever. Um, but thank you very much, and I'd like to applaud them for doing such great work within the community, um, empowered by CSN CSIR. Uh, through TV White Space. Okay, my name is Lerato Rampana. My name is Lerato Rampana, and I'm not sure if I'm still youth, but anyway, I'll take it. <laughs> um, I am from a company called Gatabo Technologies. Um, it's actually a group company, and the technology is a sub uh, division of the group. Um, I'll just take you through a couple of things. Um, I'm not going to say much. It's just the landscape, the opportunities, current challenges, and we'll then conclude. Who are we? Um, Katawa Technology is an ICT company um, delivering smart schools and rural development white space network and providing secure state of the art solutions in areas of integrated business solutions and um, product development, uh, internet and internet applications, communication and network services. Our business has both the ECS service license and the ECNS license. From um, which was uh, operated by ICASA. In addition, we have participated in sector development programs such as these, and the combination of these have provided us the ability to participate in infrastructure in installations and gain partnership with, um, in Bloemfontein we have a Bloom Water, and the likes of Coca-Cola as well as major telcos um, including MTN and Vodacom. We are also a um, national partner with uh, both MTN and Vodacom. Um, our broader sector association, uh, public, private, and industrial bodies, and our uh, contribution to the sector includes representation in the land in infrastructure panel, and to date we have had an annual intake of um, interns. Our landscape, and this is my um, head of tech's proud uh, work. I'm sure if he was the one presenting here, he will show all his 
beautiful work of him climbing all the towers and doing all the work, but it's just me here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but all the videos, if you like to view them, we are playing our videos in one of the stands outside in the foyer. So you can contact him. There he's sitting, Lehana. Her name is also Lehana. <laughs> um, we are enabled to develop the Wi-Fi hotspots um, and digital services through the TV Wide Space Network within Botabelo, which is um, the largest township in the Free State and the second largest in South Africa. Located 45 minutes outside of Bloemfontein, the coverage within that area grants us the opportunity to service the community or prospective um, entities um, that we have identified within that area to date. 73% of those being schools and libraries and 27% being the state-owned and uh, the business within the, the community. Opportunities. Okay, our business has never been dependent on any third party funding. Rather, we've been able to have access to financial and non-financial support through um, programs like this and developing, developing programs. And similarly, um, the initial stage of this program um, was a result of being one of the four licensed and female-owned uh, beneficiary selected by UNDP and CSIR through uh, the community, throughout the country to develop a, um, affordable broadband uh, network. With the final network deployment, the community will have access to e-learning, e-health, and e-services such as public, safety and local government services. Beyond this, Global Trends has proven rural agriculture as being among the top sector, especially in Botabelo and in the free state uh, that will benefit from TV white space and a sector which is one of the main economic drivers in the free state. Current challenges. Our business has never, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, our biggest challenge has always been gaining access to the market, especially being uh, amongst the big, playing uh, behind, against the bigger players within the mainstream, uh, your MTNs, your Vodacoms, and your uh, Telecom. Uh, the de deployment of two white space is going to give us access and the ability to cover out the alternative market share that is not being tapped into. Acknowledging the progress that has been done and investment that has been done by the government by auctioning the spectrum and developing and, and the development of uh, SA Connect through state agencies such as um, ICASA, CETA, BBI, Centec, we believe that SMMEs, we as SMMEs, we have a significant role to work with both government and private sector in achieving a national rural connectivity goal. Of the challenges remain um, gaining, uh, having infrastructure investment for an upgraded network to enable us to reduce operational cost and diversify also, uh, diversify and also being able to upscale. And also uh, favorable legislation such as regulations around one. Deliberated will around this, the role and in, intended economic inclusion of SMMEs in the role out of digital connectivity for both the private and the public sector. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Lerato Rampana. Wrapping up the second session is the CEO of Mdanzani Mobile, Mr. Songezo Mahambi. His Excellency, Mr. Songezo, <laughs> has said that we should greet you on his behalf. Thank you. I've been getting the message from multiple parties as ever since I walked in. It's quite an honor. I, I'll actually respond to him on Twitter. <laughs> we normally respond to each other on Twitter. Now we know where to get a hold of it. <laughs> yeah, I could do some followers. Yeah, um, good morning. Yeah, I have to echo uh, Mr. Natin Bele's words. Uh, that 2.5 billion, that's... Uh, yeah, we can certainly help with that. Um, I didn't prepare any slide as well. Um, I think, you know, when you've been uh, eating and sleeping and having this thing for breakfast, lunch, and supper the past four years, uh, it's, it becomes part of you. Uh, someone can wake you up at midnight and you can talk about it nonstop. I'll try to be short, though. Who is um, Das Wi-Fi? Um, DAS Wi-Fi is an ISP um, <laughs> that was founded in a back room in Tanzania uh, back in 2019 in May. Um, it's, it's a, I think a few of the people here already know that story, um, like um, Dr. Mfup and, uh, and them. Um, you know, for about the first, I think the first four months, uh, this network ran from my bed, and no one knew it was running from my bed. <laughs> because we couldn't afford anything. Um, so, well, that's, uh, you know, that's the price you get from leaving a corporate job and starting a business with nothing in your pocket. Uh, but it had to be done, uh, because there was a challenge in the township. Uh, no ISP wanted to come to Mdanzani. Uh, no business took us seriously. And, you know, it baffled me because we were talking, we're talking about 60,000 households across a 50 square kilometer area, and no one is taking us seriously. And um, a study from the census, I think in 2011, uh, showed that 72% of our people there had no access to the internet, and about 5 to 6% of them could only the access, access the internet when they were at work. And now, uh, about 90 to 95% of these people work in town, which means they're not accessing the internet in the township, which means it's, um, it's, it, it's seen as a privileged kind of service. Um, you, you know, I was just listening to that slide, uh, 2.5 billion. Um, and uh, yeah, we're very excited about that. <laughs> And uh, so something sprang up to me, um, something, a very familiar topic that we had begun to talk about. Um, you know, I, I, had a, I, I just actually had a discussion about the very same thing with, um, with a team at uh, some of the leadership at, at OpenServe not so long ago, about looking at fixed wireless in terms of open access. Because we have this uh, romantic idea that open access refers to fiber the fiber infrastructure. Why can't we have open access in fixed wireless? Uh, we've got all these towers scattered around the country close to what, MTN is what, 6,000 of them, telecoms about 5,000. If you put this thing together, you're, all, you're probably looking at about 15,000 towers scattered around the country. Why aren't we looking at fixed wireless in open access? So that you can help the smaller ISPs get a level playing ground in terms of the market access. Because I think with all the things that we're battling with, one of the key areas is deploying infrastructure. I mean, at nodes, DAS Wi-Fi, um, you know, Katab, we're not going to have um, 1.4 billion in the next five years to deploy infrastructure. And looking at the speed at which this thing is going currently, you know, you, you've, you've got your major players uh, deploying infrastructure all over the place. Now, in order to catch up, 
even if we were to bind together whatever sense we've got left in our bank accounts, we're never going to compete with that. So we need someone, someone needs to step in and stabilize that market and crush whatever monopoly is there. And the only way to do that is to open the access, not only on fiber that's running underground or overhead, we need to open a fixed wireless access for everyone to play in and, you know, and, and not have two to four people controlling that market. You, you look at the local government level, for instance. Why are municipalities not owning fiber infrastructure? Why are the local municipalities not controlling fiber infrastructure? Why are we simply just giving out way leaves and just uh, you know, allowing monopoly to start building up only to complain about it in five to 10 years time and say that the infrastructure has been monopolized. We like shooting ourselves in the foot and we do it with such pride and smiles in our faces. And no one is saying, wait, let's, let, let's stop a second and let's listen. That's why when I was just looking at that infrastructure and it dawned on me that the role of the ISP is about to evolve. You know, um, let's go back to the 18th century. Edison creates DC current. Tesla comes in with alternating current. These are private entities. But do you know a private company today who still controls electricity? No. Who's to say that the internet infrastructure is not going in that direction in 10 years' time? Why must we wait for 10 years? Why can't we do it now? Because if the government controls access to this infrastructure and the government has got the financial resources to get this done, if the government can do this themselves, then it's easier for smaller ISPs such as Blast Wi-Fi and Ednos and all of them to come into the market much easier because you don't have to think about capital outlay in order to get things done, in order to take off. You know, because if you, if, if, if you look at the rate of take up, when we launching, I mean, um, Nati can attest to this. You decide to launch a fiber product. Um, and I always talk about this parameter. Um, every time I speak to all our partners and uh, uh, suppliers, I say, one delay is here. And I always say, to me, the most important thing is the cost to connect a customer. That's the most important thing. We, we, we can do all things, we can present all technologies and say we're going to sell fixed wireless packages. But the question I'm going to ask you is what's the cost to connect a customer? How much is that terminal? We can come and bring, um, you know, Starlink. But the question I'm going to ask is if the cost to connect a customer through Starlink is still sitting at seven and a half to eight thousand, how am I going to connect a home in the township? How possible is that? Someone needs to pay the piper, someone needs to pay for that equipment. Who's going to pay for it? I'm going to say to a home in, in Tanzania that's got a combined income of 15 to 25,000, pay me 8,000 rands in order to connect your home and then pay me 1,500 a month or 500 bucks a month. It makes no sense. Now, which brings me to the idea of the shared economy. We need to recognize and realize and accept the fact that we are now living in the shared economy. We cannot keep looking at things as black and white anymore. Connecting a home in an informal settlement cannot be viewed the same way as connecting a home in the suburbs. You've got a, this area that is congested with all these informal settlements, and you're gonna, are you going to go into that area and say that everyone here must cough up their sign-up fees, we're going to put up an antenna outside each and every home. Why must we do that? You know, hence, when the CSIR came, uh, with the idea that let's have all these scattered APs, regardless of how we're delivering the service, whether, whether it's via TVY space or the normal five gigahertz point to multipoint, it's fine. But imagine you walk into an informal settlement, a rector pole in the middle of, that, of, those, of, of, those, uh, of those households, and you put an AP so powerful that at least five to 10 homes in that radius can connect to this. And it doesn't always have to be a case of a hotspot, a standard hotspot where you've got someone picking up their phone and looking for the SSID and connecting. You can also connect these guys using 
just a normal chip, uh, you know, dual band router. We've tested this and it worked. Um, you put, you, you, you erect an AP in the middle of this uh, informal settlement. And then you just sell a standard, uh, you know, dual band router to each and every home for about 250 bucks or 300 bucks. And they're ready to connect to your service. And in that way, you don't only have one person connecting with a phone because a hotspot is gonna go and look at the address of that device, which is the MAC address. Imagine if it's looking at the MAC address of a device that can be shared inside the house, such as a dual band router instead of, a, instead of just one cell phone. Now, these are just some of the possibilities that come with the intervention that the CSIR has brought to, to, to the rural communities. I'm not sure if I can call them as any rural community. Uh, I think it's a, pretty much uh, semi-urban. Um, so, th th you know, we can, we can speak all day, but these are just some of the opportunities. And you, for instance, at the moment we're grappling with, uh, th there's one microwave link and we, that we're trying to build, and I'm, and I'm thinking that I'm sitting there, that, you know, TVY space might be new, but um, I, I'm sure Keith is, is listening very carefully to this one. It might be new, but, um, you know, us, the people who have been in this game, uh, you know, going through all the difficulties, the challenges, and, uh, and some of the challenges are very financial in nature. Now, imagine I'm trying to build a microwave link. Uh, Wandele knows about this project, and we, we, we are, we're battling about it uh, for some time. Um, it's been about two months now. Uh, you know, we're trying to build a microwave link from an area that's just 10 kilometers away from where we're taking this link. But we can't get there because there's some hill that makes no sense is sitting in the middle of nowhere. And we can't get to the other area. Now, we have to go and co-locate somewhere to redirect this signal. And I'm asking myself, no man, but wait. You know, there's a new technology that's coming that kind of beats line of sight, which is TVY space. If we can get TVY space to a point to the highest level of quality that we can do such point to point uh, signaling, then imagine the amount of money that I'm cutting by not paying that guy that's sitting on the side there on that tower to put two radios to do a point to point and, to an and put other two radios to do another point to point. Now I'm buying four radios instead of just two radios to do my point to point. Now if TVY space could come in and be able to solve that problem and cut through that mountain, I'm only using two radios. It's just one of the examples. So there's a lot of cost cutting opportunities you know, that, that, that are brought to the fore just by the existence of TVY space. Now let's talk about um, the, the project. Um, I, I, just, I was just doing a high level overview. I talked too much and that I did warn you. So let's talk about uh, CSIR. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the Rural Connectivity Project, because that's why we're here. What opportunities are we seeing? Okay, you know, we, Das Wi-Fi started as, uh, fortunately, we started as a community Wi-Fi network uh, where we were putting up all these um, scattered hotspots around the area, and people were connecting using vouchers, the debit cards, and we were so obsessed with the coverage question so much that we experimented, I think, across about four or five brands until we arrived at uh, one brand that we stuck with until now. Um, <laughs> when Dr. Mfupe brought um, an, another brand uh, for, for us to test. But I think anyone here who operates in the public Wi-Fi space will tell you that our biggest challenge, Keith and I were just talking about this outside just now, our biggest challenge is the coverage, the radius this, this, that these APs can deliver, because you're gonna get a lot of claims of 300 meters on the spec sheet, but the time, moment you put it on uh, in practice, in real world, you get 100 meters or even 50 meters. Um, you get some that can't even cut through walls. So it's, it, it, it's, it's a major challenge. I think that's where the focus needs to be. The focus needs to be there. Um, we. If, if we keep continuing um, to do things in such a way that um, 
we simply solve problems after the fact. We, we, we're not gonna get anywhere. Um, I think we learned a lot of lessons in phase one. Um, so we, we've been very careful. Um, I think the CSIR has also, has also been very careful in making sure that um, we don't get into the trap of trying to solve problems after the fact, because now you are talking about a very complicated equation. You're talking about things that have been erected in people's houses. You're talking about poles that have been erected and stamped on the ground, meaning every time you need to make a change, <laughs> you need to bring excavators to, take, to uproot these things. We've gone through that exercise. Um, Nati has gone through that exercise. Um, I think you've also gone through that exercise. <laughs> we've, we've had to uproot these things at cost and, and get them you know, re, re, reallocated to different areas. So we're trying our best now not to try and solve problems after the fact. And most of these problems are not as a result of poor planning on our end. It's as, it is a result of trusting the vendors that are giving you the product to say, um, I am so and so, I'm Cambia, I'm Ubiquiti, this is what I can do. If you put me there, I'll connect 500 people over 200, uh, 200 uh, meter radius. But when you put it in practice, uh, you're only getting 50 meters and you're connecting only 30 people. So those are just some of the challenges. But these challenges are common in Wi-Fi. So it, I, I think that's why you're hearing that most of the speakers are not even mentioning those because we, we are so optimistic about the CSR project that we know we can solve them because they are common. They're just common problems. We haven't come across any problems that we believe are too impossible to solve. Um, so in that, um, I, I really have to thank the CSIR, the UNDP, uh, Indigo, um, uh, everyone who got involved in getting this done. Um, we have not perfected it yet. Uh, but as I said, we're not here to talk about the problems that we've got on site. So those are things that we can resolve, we engineers. We, we're here to talk about the opportunities that this brings. And those opportunities are not only geared towards the end user and the WISP or the ISP themselves. There are other people who benefit from this. Uh, there's a model that MDAS Wi-Fi has been using since 2019. For instance, You've got vouchers that need to be sold, that need to be distributed. Print those things out, give them to the local spaza shops and give them 20% commission. Maybe you wanna give them 10, I don't know. Or be like Vodacom and MTN and give them 12, but we give them 20%. You know, you, you give them vouchers, they sell them for 20%. Not just the spaza shops, um, the normal people around the community, you give them these vouchers, they sell them, they make 20%. Now there's an economy that's growing. It might, it might be a small scale, but it's growing. You look at, um, you know, for instance, we, we, Nati mentioned the issue of site acquisition, which is quite challenging uh, for all of us, uh, where you have to convince someone to, you know, allow you to erect a tower. For instance, we've, we've got a very simple model for this. All our towers are sitting in private properties uh, because we simply go walk out to the, resident, to, 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 the, to the resident and say, hey, would you like free internet for life? Who's gonna say no to that? <laughs> yeah, uh, Butler knows uh, that that's the, that's the approach um, that, that, we, that we're using. We simply walk, walk to that premises, a small business, whether it's a service station or a home, and we say, would you like free internet for life? When are you coming to put it in? So we're coming tomorrow. And all we do, we put a mini tower up, we put our sectors up, we start connecting the customer, we put it on solar and backup power, we don't even interrupt your electricity, it runs independently. So it's a community approach to business and it's a formula that actually works because you've got someone who's looking after that infrastructure, you don't have to worry about vandalism. Security is tight, it's sorted. That person is gonna look after that infrastructure because they benefit from it. So that's the communal approach of it. So you're also looking at um, opportunities for schools, for learning. Um, I don't know how the current uh, SA Connect is going to approach uh, the schools, but um, I've, I've, got, I've got a concern. Uh, it, it might be a bit too forward for me to ask this question, but I'm gonna ask, I'm always forward, so I'll ask this question anyway. We're gonna go and put Wi-Fi inside a school and connect that school. And we're gonna say that all the kids are connected. When are they connected from eight to two? What happens when that child goes home? That's my question, because that's the question that we need to answer. Because if you look at the ratio of the time that they spend on the internet, 
it will probably be 10 or 20 percent of the time that they spend during school hours. 80 or 90 percent they are spending it while they are at home in their neighborhoods. What are we doing to answer that question? Because that's the question we need to answer. I'm not saying that we're focusing on the wrong places or the wrong points, but I'm saying that we need to give due attention to the things that we need to be giving attention to. For instance, um, th there was an invitation, um, um, at, when was uh, from Albrecht Bank, the, that uh, proposal from UNDP uh, that came up. And, and the proposal that I had put to them, uh, it's just a pity that they couldn't find everyone. And the proposal that I had put to them said, no, look, um, they asked, look, um, if we ask you to identify a couple of schools that you want to connect, what would you do with that opportunity, that infrastructure? I said, well, we will connect the school, but under one condition. When we connect the school, we want to put a small tower on top of the school, and then we want to put some sectorized access points that are pointing at the neighborhoods surrounding the school so that we can at least catch at least the kids that are within the 800 to one kilometer radius of the school so that once they leave the school, they can still use the voucher that was allocated by the principal's office to connect to the same network while they are at home in order to do that, that, that homework efficiently. Because let's face it, not all the kids are coming from homes where they can afford and kept internet monthly. So these are just some of the uh, opportunities that are out there. And I think that with government coming in and, 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 and finally playing a role in saying that let's look at open access in terms of fixed wireless, I think all these things will then be possible. I veered off all the way from my speech that I wrote here, uh, so I will end it here. Um, I think this was also important. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting us, uh, Prof. Um, I hope I hope phase two, um, you know, will be <laughs> twice the. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know what we went through. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we hope phase two. Good luck with, uh, to all the phase two participants. Um, I, di I didn't know that uh, they were also here. It's, um, I was glad to meet some of them. Um, good luck with that. Uh, we are available, um, should you need us. Um, I, I hope I don't get into trouble for saying this. I'm going to say all of us are available. Should you need us for advice? <laughs> um, look, uh, the mission is one. Let's get people connected at an affordable price and go as far as broad, as wide as possible. But let's not, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that's happening in communities where we've deployed uh, this infrastructure at great personal and financial cost. Um, th there's a lot of uh, big players that are coming into, in, into those communities because you showed them that the market exists in the township. And there's nothing wrong with it. But entrepreneurs need to wake up from this, uh, you know, uh, this self-pity mentality that when you see a big player coming into your area, oh my goodness, I'm a victim. Uh, they're coming to take market. It's not your market. Don't own it. You simply are walking someone uh, that there's a market there. Now you need to adapt, you need to evolve, and you need to find ways to survive. And there are ways to survive. There are ways to survive. Um, so, so some of these players are not even dealing with end users. They are open access fiber operators. Find a way to work with them where possible. I know some of them are difficult, especially the red ones. Um, but, um, you, you know, uh, you, you've got the green team and the green and yellow team that are more flexible. Um, I, I'd want to get arrested. That's why if I can't, we, we, can, we can hardly finance a lawsuit. Um, but, uh, you know, those are just some of the possibilities, and there are some markets that, uh, you know, some players are not going to be interested in, uh, because to them it's uh, games of numbers, of ones and zeros, but that's not how you and I look at people. That's not how we look at, um, at, at our market. We look at them with an open heart. That's why I always say that, um, you know, you, you may panic uh, that, hey, when is this business going to make me rich? Uh, it, that, that's... It's important, but it's not entirely important. Uh, because what I always say is more important is anyone can deploy infrastructure. Anyone can come in and deploy infrastructure. But the level of customer experience that you give, no one can easily replicate that. 
you can be servicing 100 customers and someone who's servicing 50,000 customers comes into your area, but your level of customer experience, the experience that they feel when they are your client, um, are you there when you need them? Um, are you there when they go down? Um, you know, the, the level of customer experience, it, it's what defines who lives or dies in this industry. It's not entirely about how much money you've got. We've got uh, big companies that are being insulted on Facebook on a daily basis. Um, <laughs> it's a reality, it's true. Um, so, all you need to do, uh, there's only one formula, and that formula needs to lead to one, one very important answer. How do I get the customer to fall in love with the product or service that I've built? Because once you get the customer to fall in love, that's limitless. Because once you capture the customer's heart, nothing can interrupt that. Have you ever seen a person in love? That's what you need to achieve. Because when a customer is in love with your product, with your service, it's, it will take a catastrophe to break that bond and that relationship. And that's limitless. Focus on that. Get the customer to fall in love and the profits will come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Songezo. We now understand why His Excellency <laughs> sent his regards. Not to, he went overboard just with two minutes. Um, it is now lunch time, and we will be back after an hour. So can we just commence at it's now 13.33. Could we please commence at 14.33? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We will be commencing to our last final session, which we will kickstart with a little bit of change, Dr. Mar Martha Suarez will be the one that will be kickstarting this session. She is joining us virtually. Martha is the CEO of DSI. Martha, you are most welcome. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we are able to hear um, you perfectly. Okay, much. So I'm speaking today on behalf of the Dynamic Spectrum Alliance. We are one of the global partners of the Digital Access Program. And because of that, we have been working uh, with the FCDO and different partners in uh, the five countries of the Digital Access Program. I would like to refer briefly to one study that we have been doing in South Africa. I know that I just have a few minutes, so I would like to go quickly to the, to the study. Uh, this is the study we have seen in the sessions before, how important it is to have access to affordable networks. Um, and many of the uh, wireless internet service providers in South Africa are providing connectivity using Wi-Fi or um, yeah, Wi-Fi networks and Wi-Fi equipment. So I'm, I would like to show, um, let me just put it like this. Um, this is a study that we have done about the importance of the six gigahertz band in South Africa. It was done by Professor Raul Katz from Telecom Advisory Services. Basically, what we did is uh, we are advocating for additional spectrum for unlicensed access or licensed exempt access in the six gigahertz band. So it means that in addition to current frequency bands in 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, we could also use 6 gigahertz. In this study, we were um, assessing the impact on the economy in South Africa, and we had different sources of values. For example, one source of value is Wi-Fi municipal. So it means the public hotspots that people can use to access internet. Another um, source of value, for example, is the enhanced broadband coverage and improved affordability. So we took different sources of value and we estimated for every source the impact on GDP, on producers and on consumers. And we translated that into, the, um, into a models and then into numbers. 
what is the situation? We have heard that, and I think there is a very good assessment, that um, we need to have improvements in fixed access. So right now in South Africa, um, uh, the WISPs are covering at least 83% of uh, fixed broadband connections. And Wi-Fi is one of the main technologies used for connectivity for that last mile. So um, taking into account that context, there is also a huge potential for development uh, of IMT, IoT, Internet of Things, and augmented and virtual reality applications in South Africa, especially because that is a way to provide local content for education, for training, etc. So we um, made study I, I would, uh, that's available at the DSA website, but I will just give you the total. We found that there could be an impact of 76 dot $53 billion in the South African economy between 2022, I mean, if ICASA would decide to open the 6 gigahertz band for license exam access this year and in, until 2031. Uh, there is a cumulative economic value because at the beginning you start deployments and the rollout of networks, so that will take a while. And that's why you have this type of behavior. And then you can see how it's going to accumulate uh, year to year. You can also see that there is an opportunity cost. So delaying decision about uh, dedicating more spectrum for Wi-Fi access, or for license exam access, will then affect, uh, it, it, it means that there is an opportunity cost. It means that uh, we are not receiving the benefits of the decision, because that will be delayed. And just to conclude, let me explain why it is important for WISPs. Um, there are many aspects that can benefit WISPs and broadband access, access in South Africa. One is that we could use 6 gigahertz uh, as a way to have more higher capacity for every access point. So it means that with the same device, you could have ma many more users. You could also provide to those users more capacity because the but channel bandwidths are larger. And we can also enhance the back home connectivity because if gigahertz can is used for mobile communications, then we can all extend that uh, uh, outdoors deployments that combine with capacity for every access point for low power indoors. And also uh, that will make it more affordable because uh, wireless internet service providers can use their same infrastructure to cover more users to provide better service. So. Um, this is what I wanted to mention today. We, um, I would invite you, I think this slide could be shared after this session. So I hope you will have the time to, to, to go through them and uh, very happy to, to coordinate partnerships to share more about these results of this study about others that we are um, currently doing. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Martha. That was very brief. We appreciate that a lot. <laughs> now, following Martha's very brief and very concise, yet very insightful presentation is Carlos Rey Moreno, the acting CEO of Zenzeleni Networks. Carlos is joining us virtually. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hi, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me fine. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. I did prepare a slide deck, but I have the feeling that um, doesn't that doesn't show properly. So let me actually present uh, without without a slide deck and um, and maybe just doing it on my on my screen here but uh, I'm I'm super glad I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm very honored that uh, you've invited uh, Senseleni here uh, and that uh, our entire session has been about four amazing uh, small ISPs working from the communities and providing services to their own communities where they saw communication needs. Uh, I think since Eleni was born 
as um, as as an organization ten years ago to 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 address that issue to address an issue where the only players were players that uh, in the sector that were coming to provide services to the communities and where the element of um, communities providing services to their to, to their to themselves that communities would uh, address their own communication needs was uh, very much foreign right uh, in I'm, I'm speaking today uh, with my, my, my sense any hat on uh, most of you also know that I work for the Association for Progressive Communications, uh, who is a global organization that is also like um, the DSA, uh, working with um, FCDO in the in the five countries. And in, in South Africa, we do work. Uh, most of the work in the digital access program is done uh, through or in collaboration with Senseleni. Uh, APC is one of the. Uh, members, the founding members of, of Senseleni, and uh, our CEO uh, resigned uh, uh, a couple of months ago, and I'm uh, stepping in while we cover the, the the process. So, hence speaking as the interim CEO for Senseleni. Uh, Senseleni is a, is a, well is is an ecosystem of organizations, right? There is the MPC where I'm currently uh, managing, and there are the cooperatives that we were hosting. Uh, that we are nurturing, that we are those SMMEs in the in the communities that uh, that uh, are providing services to themselves. So currently, uh, or for some time now, uh, Senseleni operates a backhaul that goes all the way from Montata into the deep rural areas uh, of uh, the Eastern Cape, and um, and then those um, SMMEs, those cooperatives. Are are the ones uh, well as uh, Songeso was saying, selling vouchers at a, at a profit. I mean at a, at a margin, uh, providing services to anchor tenants in the in the rural areas. Um, there has been a lot of evolution. I mean, ten years sounds a lot, no? When when all these four amazing SMEs have achieved so much during two years and under COVID. But uh, since Eleni started as a, as a research project that has been evolving. Over, over the years, it is only in 2017 that we incorporated the the MPC to 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 support uh, other other cooperatives, other SMEs, and, and we've been very grateful to the support of of TIA among others who have allowed us to to expand our operations into into other communities uh, and um, and to keep on evolving our model because. It is true that it's difficult, and, and, and again, uh, I take my hat to, to the four SMMEs operating uh, and that have presented today. Um, at the same time, operating in deep rural areas have a, a, another subset of challenges in relation to distance, in relation to other services, in relation to density of the population, in relation to to, to, to the people and to the, the I guess, yeah, a lot of the effort lately has been going into catalyzing the the, the internet ecosystem, as we call it. Um, as many reports from the ITU and others point out, connectivity is already there. It's already in many places. Affordability is one of the elements, but so it is usage. Many people don't know or don't find value or don't know how to derive value from the internet. So a lot of our focus, especially over the last year and a half, has been precisely on, on, on that. Uh, uh, we installed a first uh, solar lab to train uh, uh, people from the community on, on digital skills and internet usage. Uh, only last week, uh, we got a second solar lab to be installed and continue continue catalyzing that, uh, that digital ecosystem. And it's, it's fascinating to see how the, the usage especially on the hotspots. We currently have around 80 hotspots among the two communities is uh, is growing. Uh, we are talking about uh, our, 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 our uh, average usage um, is around three terabytes per month from the hotspots in these rural communities where where only last year we have we had half of that of that usage um, affordability for us. Uh, is something that we take very seriously. Uh, users in Senseleni, in the hotspots in Senseleni, they access uh, uncapped Wi-Fi for 25 rands a month. Uh, we are currently 
coming up with new vouchers uh, for a smaller size because even 25 rands is is not something that they that they are able that they they have cash to pay. So we are we are starting to play around with smaller vouchers for sm you know smaller amounts, smaller number of days, because um, yeah again rural affordability in rural South Africa means means something totally different. But um, yeah, besides that, especially during 2022, we've been uh, working a lot on consolidating our model. Uh, we've realized that there were many communities asking for support to Senseleni uh, to come up with their own models and that we didn't have the capacity to support them. So we've been um, reorganizing the, the structure of both uh, the, the SMMEs as well as the, as the MPC. Um, to be able to do so, coming up with a new cost structure, not only on the vouchers, but also, I guess, all ISPs and, and the SMMEs that just presented can feel the pressure of the of the fixed wireless and fixed LTE prices coming down from the LTE operators. Um, but we've also been, I've been, I will be talking about that, uh, we've been working on sharing our knowledge. From the beginning, since the learning has been very much about sharing anything that we knew and everything that we've learned over the years, but now, we, uh, with the support of FCDO, we've institutionalized that. Um, from the beginning of uh, 2022, the first school of community networks is taking place, also with the support of TIA, of the support, with the support of the Northern Cape Municipality. And seven communities are, being, are going through uh, different stages of, of, of learning and mentorship, training and mentorship, both physical and online, uh, that will finalize on the on the 8th and, and 9th of December, where we will be hosting a similar stakeholder, a multi-stakeholder event similar to this one, and I use this opportunity to invite you. I will, I will make, uh, I will make sure that all of you are invited, and if you want to come, it will be a great opportunity to to find the synergies that uh, Lusango and others were were talking about, because I think it is only by uh, by sharing and by sharing resources, I, I think uh, was Ongeso who was talking about the sharing economy is is where 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 communities are gonna be able to to share. Uh, I mean to to reach to reach that sustainability and to 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 meet that goal that Peter Melo was talking about earlier in his in his presentation, right? Uh, whereby all communities in South Africa can indeed. Benefit from benefit from the the, the digital economy. Uh, besides that, uh, we've been also establishing MOUs with learning institutions, uh, with the schools in the in the rural communities, uh, with Walter Sisulu University, in order to potentially extend their EduRoam network into our into our backbone. So it was very much felt during COVID that most of their students. Uh, had to travel to WSU facilities in order to, to use the internet. And because of the footprint that we have in the region, um, so, so they, can, they can also use it wherever we are and use it, use it for free, right? Uh, at the end of the day, as, as I said, we are a non-for-profit organization just trying to, to catalyze that digital ecosystem wherever possible and with the resources that we, that we do have. We've been also uh, collaborating with the Situlele District Hospital. Again, we are we are signing an MOU with them, not only to provide um, with install uh, 15 hotspots uh, for improving their their services and, and collaborated with uh, Vula Mobile so they can uh, increase and improve their services and, and so their doctors have also and their uh, nurses have also the potential to to access other information. But also, we are exploring uh, how we can uh, connect their satellite clinics into into the hospital to also uh, assist them with uh, with second opinion. Uh, I I don't know who, who was talking about the the the, the element of um, local content and local services, and and we can only agree with that. Um, I was not mentioning that uh, the internet might not be considered relevant to to many of the people in in rural areas and. And during COVID, we did quite a lot of effort, also with the support of FCDO, in creating materials that were locally uh, locally uh, relevant in relation to COVID and good COVID practices. Also, we zero rated the connectivity to the hospital, so in case you know uh, they they could uh, coordinate with the doctors 
uh, that were there in the City Lele Hospital for any doubts that they that they could have. Um, so so they felt safe during the pandemic. Um, and yeah, a bit a bit on the on the school of community networks and in general on sharing, right? On on the on 2018 we hosted the well there is a a, a summit on community networks in uh, in Africa that APC together with ISOC has been uh, uh, supporting from from 2016. In 2018 it took place in in, in South Africa. It was hosted by Senseleni in the Eastern Cape. Uh, many many people many people came and again with the support of fcdo we managed to sponsor 18 south africans to to come and to participate that were kind of the the seed of the of the school of community networks then again in 2019 when it took place in in uh, in tanzania and we had the opportunity to meet uh, dr lusango there um, we 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 also managed to sponsor again thanks to FCDO another 10 participants and then guide them through a mentorship program of uh, of a couple of months right after where a movement of these organizations could start taking place but then this has consolidated and solidified in 2021 and now in 2022 with this school of community networks where uh, communities from northern cape limpopo uh, eastern cape uh, houten and and and, and the Western Cape are, are taking part of it. I mean, Hanif, who was making an amazing presentation before, is also part of the of the advisory committee and is also part of the different structures. So, so it is a pleasure to see how all this movement is weaving. And uh, and, and and only looking forward for more collaboration with with each and every one of you uh, who have made presentations today. But besides uh, the, 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 the service provision in the in the region, uh, the, the nurturing of the of the cooperatives and, the, and other SMEs in the area, and besides uh, sharing and nurturing this movement of of communities providing services to themselves, we've been very active on the policy and regulatory front, both uh, participate, participating in all uh, public consultations that have been taking place from ICASA or from DCDT from all the way to 2016, I would say, and, and making some, some of the claims that have, been, that have been made today. I think uh, it was Hanif who was saying that they are saving for the, the license, right? I'm very glad that the others have, uh, have got their licenses, but getting the license is only the beginning. Then the compliance continue, and it has a lot of costs associated to it. As, and as Songhesa was saying, the most important thing here, and given the the, the economic situation of the users is that everything at the end needs to be passed into the customers. So all those costs of licenses, all those costs of compliance are very high for s small uh, enterprises that, uh, that want to, to provide services to, to poor communities in, in South Africa. And I, I, we've been advocating for a, a community network license. We've been make, uh, uh, you know, providing support in other in other jurisdictions such as Kenya, where where a, a community network license that is way cheaper and with a way more reduced compliance structure has been incorporated into the licensing framework. And I hope Picasa, you know, is is willing to 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 learn from that experience and to implement something similar. Um, We've been also advocating, and in other countries, again, Kenya, Argentina, where USF has been put at, uh, has been in countries where there is such a license, the USF is, is, is something where community networks can apply for it. Um, and I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy to, 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 to hear from, from Peter uh, about those 2.5 billion that, that will be made uh, available to or some of them to SMMEs, and I really hope that, that, that the SMMEs here, including Zanzeleni, can contribute to, to do that. I think is is very, I, I respect a lot that statement, right, from DCDT of acknowledging that uh, closing the digital in, divide in South Africa can only take place from emerging actors, that that, that recognition that uh, MNOs can go as far as they can go. I, I think it was the representative from, um, Ocean View saying that they have done a great work and it's true, but they also don't do such a great work in rural and remote areas and that others are there to step in and to cover. So I really hope that uh, that partnership can take place. 
Uh, the same with open access. And there were some pictures on my presentation, and those of you who have visited this in Zeleni know that we had to build towers to reach rural areas as far as, far as 20 meters from a telecom tower that was underutilized. And that's because open access is not a thing. Is that because the resources in rural areas are not optimized and made efficient for reducing the price of uh, connectivity to the, let's say, the poorest of the poor in South Africa. And, and there is no such a thing of enforcing uh, infrastructure sharing. I really hope that uh, the, the SMMEs will, will partner and will move, grow and, and continue sharing resources to do that. But there are other players that simply don't want to share. And uh, I hope that uh, in that SA Connect plan that, that, that it was presented through the infrastructure that BBI and Centec do have in rural and remote areas, they also consider different price structures for different type of enterprises that, that, that are there for a, for a different layer of profit or, for a, or even for a no, not profit, just for covering you know, the, a gap in the market or a gap in the society that is not covered by commercial, commercial forces. And just to touch a bit on the on the presentation from from Professor Mecuria, again, uh, you, those of you who have heard me in the past, spectrum sharing is something that we've been exploring and promoting for a long time. I do support everything that Martha has said around Wi-Fi and everything that T, you know CSIR has done around TV white spaces. And I think fixed Wi-Fi is something that we have all learned from the pandemic. That is a requirement for society and for everything in relation to bringing more, more connectivity, yet access, the best way of providing access is via mobile spectrum. Uh, I think ICASA and the department have done a lot of progress into releasing that spectrum. I think uh, there has been a recognition of the submissions that were made by APC and Senseleni around spectrum sharing and that the licenses issued last month to include clauses for spectrum sharing in five years. Uh, but five years is too long. Uh, five, only SA Connect want to meet their goals in three years, and, uh, and, and operators will only be sharing their spectrum in five years' time. And I think there are win-win situations whereby there could be broker relationships in between those MNOs and these SMMEs, that, such as the ones that are represented here, uh, whereby using that spectrum that is going to be underutilized by them. I, we can go as many, we can do as, as many studies as you want in relation to, to how much uh, mobile spectrum is underutilized in rural areas, but we know that. I mean, they were not using 900 and uh, 1800, and they are not going to use the, 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 the tons of spectrum that have been released now in rural areas. They are super useful and super necessary in dense urban areas. In rural areas, they won't use it. So, so, so. The, Creating incentives for everyone to share a spectrum, I think, is something that is necessary. I think the tools that CSIR are implementing are critical to do that in a non-interfering basis. And I think there are many SMMEs that are here to, to support in that expansion and to provide South Africans with the coverage and the, and the, and the, and the connectivity that they deserve. Wi-Fi is great, but uh, designing a, a network with Wi-Fi Maintaining a network with Wi-Fi, providing services with Wi-Fi is way more complicated. All of us, we use Wi-Fi because it's the only technology that is license exempt and available to us. We are starting to use the white spaces for the same reasons. But uh, if other spectrum was made available to us, things were, were, would be done quicker and we would, uh, we would, they would be done cheaper and than, than, than it is done with Wi-Fi. Anyway, uh, thank you very much uh, for, 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 for giving me the opportunity to, to be here. Congratulations again to UNDP, to CSIR, to FCDO, to TIA, to, DS, to ICASA, to C DCDT. The problem of closing the digital divide is not an easy one. So congratulations for, for organizing this event and for joining forces and supporting each and everyone who is raising its hand to, to close it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. May you kindly just refer to the question that was asked via Teams and provide your answer. We, we will now welcome 
the representative from NYDA who will be joining us online, Reboni Majola. Welcome, Reboni. Reboni, are you online? It seems that Reboni yeah. is not online. We will continue and head right straight to the panel discussion, who will, which will be rather facilitated by the professor who's making his way right now. Professor, I am not sure how to pronounce the surname. Never mind, I'm used to it. <laughs> I am sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm sure we were all excited to be here. It's been a very productive day. Um, also very refreshing to be back in person uh, with other human beings. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to be facilitating the panel. Uh, I'm also, of course, sitting in a very dangerous place between people and the end of the meeting. So I want to make sure that we are very efficient with the way we use time. Um, so we have about an hour. We'll go till about f 10 past four. Uh, please, could I ask all the speakers to be very succinct? Uh, please take only two to three minutes, and then we'll have time for just one question or comment or clarification, and then we'll let the panelists respond. Hopefully, there'll be a bit of time at the end for a more interactive discussion. Uh, but that's, I think, the best we can do with the time, that, the limited time that we have, and also just to make it a little more interactive than uh, previous, previous sessions. Okay, so with that said, uh, let me check if the, our first speaker is available. He's online, Dr. Ho Sang Yo. He's in South Korea. And um, is, he, is he available? So while we're getting uh, Dr. Yeo, um, so just to, perhaps for me to briefly reflect on what we've heard so far, um, what came to my mind is the old saying. So it takes a, a village to raise a child. Uh, in this case, these very beloved four children with their parents are all here, these wonderful startups, these wonderful SMMEs. And I think it's fair to say it takes an ecosystem to raise these children. So. It's good that the ecosystem is well represented here from government, private sector, um, civil society, industry associations, and so on. So, so that's one reflection. Then the other one, very briefly, while we're waiting for Dr. Yo, is um, so, so in the business school, uh, my areas of research and teaching are around technology and operations management, uh, digital business, as well as innovation. Now, in the innovation space, there are two sort of innovation modes that we talk about. One is called STI, that stands for Science, Technology, and Innovation. And then the other one is called DUI. So this is innovation by, by, by doing, using, and interacting. And I think this project is a perfect example of uh, the, these two modes of innovation very, working very well together. So you've got the STI coming from, from CSIR, and then the SMMEs putting all of this into practice, taking these innovations to market through the DUI innovation mode. Uh, is Dr. Yo available? Okay, let me go to the next panelist then. Um, 
So this is Mr. Sanele Kumisa from the Black IT Forum, or our other representative from the Black IT Forum. <laughs> yeah, please. Yes. Yeah, or you, or you can turn on your mic if, if you're more comfortable speaking from there, no problem. You need to press the button, the red light goes on, and then you can oh, speak. Yeah. yeah. Is it okay, so, so two, two, two or three minutes, please, so very briefly, position okay. from um, your end. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you to the colleagues. Uh, I am not Sanele Kumisa. <laughs> my name is um, Fundo Shope. Um, I am with my colleague Cindy here, who called me very late last night and hijacked my day today to come and say a few things today about this process. Fortunately enough, as the Black IT Forum, or unfortunately, um, <clears throat> we have uh, quite a few enemies here uh, because of our advocacy in trying to avail opportunities to uh, SMMEs, black professionals, students, and academia. Um, being part of this uh, spectrum allocation process has been a very lengthy exercise from our part, and we have observed very closely at how it impacts your ordinary SMME with zero budget. Um, the ICT space in various ICT uh, cluster working groups has been a bone of contention as to how do we get your basic SMMEs to be network operators. Ten years ago, I remember uh, there were very, very few black people who would think that they would be owning a network. And we are proud as the Black IT Forum to have played a role in facilitating opportunities for SMMEs. Two of the SMMEs present today were submitted by the Black IT Forum. So uh, we're still going to make the noise, make more enemies, but uh, that's what we are all about. Thank you very much. Excellent. Th th thank you. Thank you for being very succinct as well. Okay, a any brief question or comment or clarification from Fundo, from the floor? Okay. Uh, if not, we'll go to the, the next panelist. Um, and that's Laura Elliott from Global Stratos. Is she available? Yes, I am. Ah. Just give me a moment here to turn on my camera. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Elliott. I'm with Global Stratos. And um, I'm currently located in the tech innovation hub in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, but I have a deep history with um, South Africa. I lived there uh, for many years, starting in 2003, and very much uh, familiar with the IT uh, sector. I used to write for one of the local IT magazines and also did a lot of work with youth. So today we're just going to talk. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our um, approach to um, empowering the rural area and just give me a moment to share the screen. And I do have more slides than I'll be showing. So for those of you who are interested, um, you'll be able to get that from uh, the facilitators of the event. Just give me a moment here. Okay, so first of all, I just wanna mention that we don't focus on technology per se. Uh, we are a technology company, but we first start from the human development perspective. So uh, we are really focused on regenerative development. And basically that's um, ensuring uh, today's um, communities as well as the future. So we really focus on issues of people, environment and economy. And of course, uh, data and also technology is very important to that, um, but um, it's not in and of itself the solution. So a lot of this stuff was already mentioned, but uh, we do, our target group is working with small scale producers, farmers and miners. 
so basically, we focus on working with the working poor in rural areas where there is money flowing. And when we can um, work with them, not only to put in technology, but to help them increase their incomes, they become the catalyst for economic development locally. So for example, if a miner goes from, um, let's say $100 a month to $300 a month in USD, sorry, I didn't translate it to RAND, um, and they are reaching 10 people in the community, they are actually helping raise that community out of poverty, which then allows additional infrastructure, such as IT, to be put in. So what we're trying to do is find a way that's profitable for everyone in order to do the the social justice and, and economic justice work in the field um, so that it's sustainable. Um, so our approach isn't just, again, to do the technology, but it's to look at the whole problem and then design from there. And so this is where we then designed um, the concept of a distributed data ecosystem. Um, basically, I'll just give you a simple definition. It's localizing what we currently do in the cloud and obviously TV white space is one of the key enablers to that. So in our model, um, uh, we can operate the network and the data center without being connected to the internet 24 by seven. So communities um, can have robust <clears throat> content and data uh, without um, having to access the internet all the time. And uh, again, I can talk more technically how that's done at another point in time. And then I just wanted to give you an example of our micro data center prototype. Um, it's less expensive um, than maintaining um, systems in um, data centers because it has no fans, no air conditioner required. So it's very suitable for extreme uh, rural environments. And so we can place, it's gonna be bigger than this. This is just um, one of the prototypes, but basically everything will be integrated into that box all the software, the applications and everything. So this is what we call our, our micro data center. And uh, again, there's plenty of details on what we do, but I do just wanna give a little bit of idea of the applications we're doing with the small scale producers. So basically um, in some areas, it's not necessarily the case with South Africa, but there are issues of identity. Um, so we have uh, identity, secure identity and verification that can be done. We can manage production sites um, we can have a robust data collection platform along with a self-serve data platform, and we have a GIS spatial platform that can be used by local stakeholders uh, for development. So um, there's a lot that's built into this, but what drives the ability to have it is the fact that there's a for-profit value chain um, in agriculture or in mining. Um, and so by helping them get efficiencies in the value chain from being informal to formal, um, you get that huge economic boost, okay? And then just some embedded opportunities in this for uh, local people, uh, data, data collectors, obviously you can become employed or become entrepreneurs doing that, natural resource technicians, we're doing a two year vocational training program, utility technicians, similar concept, uh, doing localized uh, energy solutions, waste solutions, and of course, technology uh, technicians. So I think one of the things here is uh, we're actually talking about how we can support SMMEs. So some of our platform, we are have already committed to um, uh, testing with local SME operator networks, some of our value added things to see if that might help them um, improve their, their business model. Um, and so we're going to be involved in that as that rolls out. Uh, we are also going to be running a full stack developer bootcamp for youth starting in the next year. And this was a piece that I added that uh, I did not mention to Dr. Mfupe, but basically um, following the developer bootcamp, then we can run a bootcamp for the developers to help them translate their skills in, into business. And so, um, you know, again, we are fully committed to um, development. That's our, our prime thing. And technology is one of the major uh, functions. So um, if you want to know more about us or our technologies or platform, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, any, any comment or, or question or clarification for Lori? I'm, I'm finished. 
uh, okay, perhaps we'll come back at the, at the end with the open discussion. Okay, so let's go to the next presenter. Um, the TIA representative, uh, the head of ICT, Tabang Mpie. Is Tabang here or online? Okay. In that case, let me go to the next panelist. Um, so this is the CEO of Smart Exchange, Jonathan Naidu. I greetings one and all, and ah. uh, thank you, Program Director, for this opportunity. Um, my message is a message of support um, in terms of being a collaboration partner with this excellent initiative from CSIR. Uh, we're a business incubator uh, based in KwaZulu Natal, having on average about 80 companies per annum within the incubation ecosystem. We're proud to have one of our companies listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and we're looking forward to be creating our next unicorn with uh, the TV White Spaces initiative. Um, the project that I want to encourage one and all is a program that we're starting in August uh, to launch Women's Month, where we want to identify 10 youthful females in the townships uh, to be uh, entrepreneurs using TV white spaces. So we're running this project with ad notes uh, down in the township of Kwamashu. By the way, we've got branches in the metro, which is a Tekweni municipality. We've got branches in a small town called Pochepston, in a rural community called Coxted, and we've got one in Kwamashu. So our replication is based on, on different economies rather than anything else, but focusing on the ICT sector. Uh, so we, we've packaged a business case uh, for female startups in the townships, and we want to encourage the other centers as well to do a similar initiative for the month of August. So if we collaborate and make this a national impact on Women's Month in August, I think this project should get much more mileage in terms of conscientizing others to be collaborative partners as we have done at Smart Exchange. So thank you very much for this opportunity to be part of a great success story. Thank you, Mr. Naidu. Uh, any questions or comments for Mr. Naidu? Otherwise, we can come back at the, during the open phase. OK, th thanks very much. So let's go to the next panelist then. Uh, this is the representative from the Department of Science and Innovation. Uh, Zomoka Kwe Tlamini. Are they in the room or online? Ah, there he is. Okay. Over to you, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, my name is Zomoka Kwe Tlamini. I work at the Department of Science and Innovation in the unit called Digital Economy uh, Capabilities uh, Research. Uh, I had prepared some uh, notes as we were uh, conducting this meeting, but uh, I thought maybe I did not read the memo because I thought maybe other people were going to have slides, but seemingly there was no memo at all, but that's fine. Uh, since I have only two minutes, I will go throw away everything and just concentrate on one thing. That uh, The question that I would like to pose is, do we, as the national system of innovation, do we have appetite for failure? How much of an appetite for failure do we have? Uh, this question comes from the fact that some years ago, I was speaking to someone. We are talking about the, uh, the mobile application development space. Uh, this person was pointing out that out of a, a big number of chunk of people that we're going to support in this program, a uh, very tiny, 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 tiny minority of them are going to succeed big. Yes, they have succeeded. There are some uh, startups that we supported through the MLAP that are now out there doing big stuff 
and some of them have also received huge amounts of funding from even JSE listed companies. But the reality of the matter is a whole number of them, majority, the big majority of those startups and the people who went through that program have failed. The questions, that question also, I think, is relevant to the space. How much of an appetite do we have of failure in the space? We need to recognize that a lot of these startups, a lot of these SMEs that we support here, chances are, are not going to make it. But those that make it will probably make it big and make a huge impact. And now the question as policymakers, as people who work in the NSI, is how much, is also politicians, is how much of a failure, appetite for failure do we have? Uh, this person went on to also to say, to give me an example of uh, making an analogy of uh, Warren Buffett, to say that Warren Buffett is regarded as uh, the most successful investor ever. And he said, not quite. What Warren Buffett has on his side is time. And a few of the stocks that he invested in actually made it big. But if you look at his portfolio, it was just average performance, most of his portfolio. So what he had was time and a few of, the, of those stocks that he invested in, making them big. And that's what I think is relevant here, that a lot of SMEs that are not going to make it. They'll probably have an average performance. But those one or two that we get and get it right and give them time will perform very well. So with that, I think, yeah, that's what that's a question that I would like to pose to this. Thank you. So before you, before you go, let, let's, let's just see if there's any, any comments or questions. So I think you've posed a very important, a very important issue. So what is our appetite, appetite for failure? So any responses from the audience? Comments or, or questions? Yes, please go ahead. Um, we live at very exciting times, especially in South Africa currently, because there's, there's a huge drive in creating self employment compared to four years ago. So, working in the non profit lobby space, you meet a lot of people that are doing business for survival, which is great because. They, they don't have time to lose, so they give it all they've got. Mm. Then you find entrepreneurs that have side hustles, that have got time to iterate through their ideas and let their um, concept, concepts develop over time. Mm. So there's a difference between the two. So the ones that are constantly, that are self-employed and are depending on their hustle for survival, they don't have a lot of support. And that's where we feel like we need a lot of structures to support us. Unfortunately, if you don't have a backing of an institution, it's very difficult for an individual who's self-employed to knock at any door. So we need to support those guys because it's very difficult for them to sustain themselves. That's why they fail. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, noted. Ja. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is just simple. Uh, and thank you so much as a government official to be here. But my question is around just, I mean, it's so disappointing when you look at the amount of funding or investments that are dedicated to research and development, especially uh, from university level. And also I've seen that um, the department is making progress when it comes to just a technology office in universities, because that's where we believe ideas need time to be tested, and also just to provide incentive for students when they enter university to progress and also have ideas of the future. That's where, when we scan the world, we see that how most countries will provide incentives. Even after high school, you'll know exactly your path, whether it's in science, whether it's investing, or else even ICT. So I just want to ask you as an official, how much of an appetite as mm. government you have mm. in investing, especially at higher learning organizations or institutions to be able to provide incentives for the young people? Because at most times, 
support programs comes to SMMEs at a very late stage, and we see, based on our history, we have not had time to develop ideas for the future that needs time, investments, and also young energy. So my question is back to you. How much of an appetite in your offices and boardrooms are you discussing about putting more funds for investments for R&D? Because China has made it, Korea has made it, all the economies we always benchmark, when you look at their success, you can see they have very big appetites when it comes to R&D, especially at the school level. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for the question. Uh, yeah. Which institution are you with? <laughs> and your name, if you don't mind. Sitembi Santombella from Ednote. OK, excellent. Thank you. I suppose by disappointment, you mean you're disappointed at the level of funding that goes to the universities. That's what you, you're referring to, especially the technology transfer offices. Uh, the, the, the white paper on science, technology, and innovation, the 2019 white paper, which basically lays down the policy for the next 10 years or 20 years, um, has taken recognition of that fact that uh, we need to strengthen the technology transfer offices at universities, especially also in terms of capacitating the uh, NIPMO, the National IP Management Office, uh, through its also its interaction with the, with the TTOs. That is recognized in the white paper. Now the question then becomes, how do you actually put it in terms of uh, implementation? That's where we will need also ideas in terms of putting together the implementation plans, but the recognition is, is, has, is, is already there. You know, it's a matter of how do we as stakeholders, we actually put up a plan that we can both implement together. You know, yeah. Um, and, can I just add yeah. on to that? If I were to pick up a call right now and call the technology TIA right now as a standalone entrepreneur, would I get assistance working on an idea that's feasible? where I need an institution like them to help me, would I get help right now? Uh, without trying to speak on behalf of TIA, because I don't work for TIA, they are an agency on themselves, they've got their own processes, operational processes. What I can say is that we think as the department, uh, the funding that we provide to TIA, yes, we recognize that it might not be sufficient. Uh, uh, but I, I think somebody is from TIA who can actually answer that question directly. <laughs> but uh, but all I'm saying is, <laughs> is that I recognize, sorry? I, I saw them in the program. I'm not sure. Where, where they, 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 they are, they are in the program. In the program. We'll, we'll, we'll certainly pass the question yeah. along to them. Cindy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But however, we recognize that we might not be funding TIA adequately. But in terms of uh, them not, not picking up your phone, in terms of you as an individual, this is something that I cannot directly comment on, what's happening there. However, there's many instances whereby uh, entrepreneurs have interacted with me personal to say that yes tia we're having a problems with them but sometimes it, it it boils down to them not understanding the processes of tia you know tia has got certain processes that they undergo for them to fund a specific technology or smme uh, and what i have picked up from some of the smmes especially uh, those that are coming from disadvantaged areas. It might also be a, a capacity or capability of being able to respond to the questionnaire that TIA puts out for, 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 for what you call, for, for them to, 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 to be able to, to fund that particular uh, SMME. Sometimes the question of not being able to answer in a scientific or technological uh, uh, way. Because what's strange like is, that. I can tell you without you even paying me right now that yeah. the, all the SMMEs in phase one, they need resources. They needed resources then, they need resources now. And we have more than enough adequate funding in the public sector which is not being directed to those SMMEs. They literally have to go and figure it out themselves 
even though we have major public institutions that are geared up to help such people that have proven concepts, working concepts, mm. to be funded and to be assisted, but they are not. They are here. They'll give you their stories. Yeah. What are we doing wrong? They've got a concept. They've got backing. Why are we not supporting them? They've got different issues, but they're struggling. What is wrong? What is wrong in the public sector? Where is the gap? Yes. Uh, look, the, the, in the public sector, the, the, there's many departments. I mean, I think every department in the public sector is allocated a certain portion of their budget to actually uh, fund the r research and develop in a specific uh, sector that they operate in. some in. instances, what we are currently celebrating today is not even um, identified. It doesn't even fall under r and when we go to speak to those institutions that we are talking about today, they don't recognize what these SMEs are doing as R&D. So clearly there's a gap in, in communication between the divisions that are supplying um, these innovative innovation agencies and the SMEs. Yes, it might not be R&D, but it might be innovation. It doesn't. <laughs> you understand? Because it might not be R&D, because there's a specific definition so of R&D that... Can I suggest we... Who do we talk to to get assistance for a specific problem that each of these SMMEs have? Because each one has got a unique. How do we support yeah. them? All four of them. Th this is a very important question mm. that uh, Cindy has raised. But I don't want to put Mr. Lamini on the spot for the whole of government. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but perhaps we can come back to it at the end. Um, mm. But I think you've raised very, very important issues, and again, issues that have come from, from the floor as well. Um, so I, I don't know if you have any final comments before we, we let you go. Uh, maybe we'll take the last question from... Or Is there another question? The gentleman there. Oh yeah, please, yeah, go ahead. Uh, your name Hello. and institution, and if you could be brief, please. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Peggy Sizwe. I'm, I'm working with uh, Nganyo Sweet Cook. Uh, I just want to find out who does the funding evaluations within your institutions. Are they employees inside, or is it you give it to other entrepreneurs to do the evaluations? For, 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 for funding? Yeah, just generally for funding. Uh, the department, because of regulations, PMFA and all these uh, procurement regulations, will never directly fund the private sector entity. So you will never get funding from the department itself, DSI. Okay. That is why we have got agencies such as TIA, such as the CSIR, and, and a whole others that can interact directly with the private sector and okay. have those, uh, what you call, uh, uh, committees, whatever, processes that they, they put up, uh, okay. or structures that they put up to actually look at the proposals that you may send to them. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so just on that point, I'm, I'm, this is a follow-up. Just on that point, um, so inside CSIR, there are people who actually do evaluations in other institutes like TA and everything. My question is, have you ever thought maybe that's where the problem is in terms of the bottleneck of having people with an employee mentality evaluating entrepreneurial uh, things? Because the risk of this mentality comes from there. I mean, if you're an employee, yeah, you like safety, so you like safe options, you know, so you're evaluating stuff that's risky. I mean, are you going to find something that you feel that is very, very risky if you have got a risk, a very low risk appetite yourself? So your, your idea is that who should evaluate? Yeah, like have entrepreneurs actually evaluating entrepreneurial pro proposals, not, not, not employees. So ca ca can, I, can I, sorry, hmm. can I just intervene? Okay, we, we have quite a few other people that need to to come in. We can come back to this issue. I, I, otherwise, I think we may spend the rest of our time just dealing <laughs> with this. Um, but I, I, I'm glad the audience has raised these important issues. And I'm glad you're here, Mr. Lamini, yeah. and you're willing to engage. Uh, so perhaps we could come back to it at the okay. end, if that's OK. No, that's yeah. um, all right. OK, thanks. Thanks. So let's <laughs> thanks, Mr. Lamini. Uh, yeah, very spirited discussion. Uh, we, we'll come back to it if we have time. Hopefully we will. So let's go to the, the next uh, panelist uh, who is from the Wireless Access Providers Association, Mr. Paul Colmer. Uh, 
Zealand. Hi guys, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Can yes, we can hear you. Hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. I'm not sure how good the connection is. We are extremely under load shedding at the moment. But I just need some confirmation that you can hear me. We can hear you, Mr. Colmer. I don't know if you can hear us. Apparently not. Oh, I can, he I can hear you now. Oh, OK. Go ahead, please. Go okay. ahead. So, <laughs> hi, guys. Um, my name is Paul, and I sit on the uh, executive committee of WEPA, the Wireless Access Providers Association. And as WEPA and myself, as project lead, I've just um, completed the first commercial TV watch based trial in South Africa, sponsored by US Trade and Development, um, where we received a uh, million dollars worth of funding. Um, and it involved partners of Microsoft, uh, Stadia, company, Adaptrum, uh, which is the white space equipment OEM project to seize we, um, a local WAPA WISP, the building hotspots, and, you know, together. And then we've just completed the original deal, was signed on the 5th of August. Um, 2019 and we're in the process now of publishing the white paper and all the associated reports. Um, I'll keep this short. Um, it was a commercial trial to, to test the commercial viability of TV white space in South Africa and I'm glad to say that yes, it is commercially viable and there are just a couple of things that we need to do and the lessons we learned from the trials and of the sites that we, we set up. We quickly, halfway through the trial, it was difficult because it was slap bang in the middle of the COVID-19 lockdown, which affected a lot of everything from supply chain to people to users and, and everything. So one big lesson we learned, we moved away from the price per gig model of selling you know, a gig of data for 10 Rand or five Rand to selling uncapped passes for durations of a day, a week, a month. And that really changed the whole model and especially the commercials of the model. So all that information is going to be published soon. I think there's only really two hurdles that I see moving forward in white space in South Africa. One is, as Dr. Ladanga from CSIR pointed out, who we work closely with in the trial, that they are the single only um, secondary geolocation database provider um, in South Africa, although there is opportunity um, for others to open databases. Um, ICASA, under state of emergency, actually gave access um, to the database for free and have yet to publish um, you know, connection fee per radio rates. And until this happens, there you can't really build the investment model for a, an additional secondary geolocation provider. That is point one. And point two is TV white space equipment is still relatively expensive. Um, and, the own, and the reason for this is it's manufactured in such small quantities. So we're now busy working on what we call going to scale. And when we talk of going to scale, we're talking of something in the region of 100 million US dollars with probably 50,000 endpoints driving hotspots. Um, a project of that scale and WAPA with its 250 member WISPs with national presence is ideally per positioned. Um, you've already heard that um, two of the people who presented today um, um, on their little projects that were funded by the CSIR. They are both WAPA members as well. And great work, guys. So going to scale at that level would dramatically reduce equipment costs, the OEMs and the chipset man manufacturers. So something we are working full ahead, full steam ahead now to make that happen 
Um, we're speaking to OE, white space OEMs. We're speaking to banks. We're speaking to all of the investment opportunities. So um, watch this space, and I'm able to take any questions if you've, you've got queries. But everything will be published very shortly on the WAPA website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So that was Paul Comer from the Wireless Access Providers Association. Any, any quick comment or question or clarification for Paul? Otherwise, we can come back at the end. Okay, question at the back. Please go ahead. Your name and institution and your question very briefly. Uh, my name is Kopano Ramashala from Bakwena Wireless. Just to have a quick question for Paul. Um, will the uh, white paper be freely available to everyone and anyone? or will it be specifically for WAPA members? It will be on a secure portal uh, um, to WAPA members on the, on the website. Um, in saying that, the WAPA membership fees are so low. If you are interested in building um, white space networks, it would be certainly worth joining WAPA. And obviously, the support that WAPA can can give you in in doing that, um, it would also be made available via um, U.S. government department, because it was done with U.S. government money. Um, but initially, that the white paper will only be available to existing WAPA members via a secure portal. Thank you for the question and the answer. Okay, let's go on. So, thank you very much, Paul. Or oh, was there another quick question? Yeah, please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Keith Patu from Indigo. Uh, Paul, you know me well. <clears throat> Paul, just a question is, to what sort of scale do you anticipate uh, or like to see the prices come down? The challenge at the moment, as we all know, is um, components, chipsets, and we know a lot of manufacturers are sitting bleak with no stock no, and no means. It is a major challenge and yes, mm -hmm. mass to market is what we're all looking at. And the second part of the question is, you say you're talking to the OEMs. There are at least six, seven TV white space OEMs currently around of which only three are type approved in this country. So which ones, and I hope one is actually focusing on to ensure it because there's quite a lot of development in the next generation of TV white space, which can't say much about it now, but it's looking very, very exciting. But very keen to find out from WIPA's point of view and all that funding um, where you'd like to see the uh, target prices come down, because we'd all like to see that. Okay. Um, could I, I'll, I'll answer that question backwards, if you don't mind. I'll answer the second part first with regarding to OEMs. Um, currently, um, Keith and the equipment uh, used from Keith's company within the trials that CSI are doing is, is Carlton equipment um, from the US, um, type approved in SA. Um, the equipment we did uh, in our commercial trials at WAPA was Adaptrum, again managed in, in the US, and Adaptrum are busy producing a next generation radio which will soon be going through type approval in SA. Um, Redline um, from Canada did get type approval, but have announced that they uh, no longer want to play in that space. And also, um, Radwin have decided, who was an Israeli OEM, um, that it's not the direction they want to follow. Um, we are talking, and because the, um, the situation, so I'm going back into the first part of the question now. Um, the commercial trial was funded with US money, which is why we had to use US equipment, because it's for trade and development to create an investment opportunity for US companies, um, which Adatrum was one of them. Also that uh, Carlson um, is also another one and the other equipment we used, which is the Cambian access point for the Wi-Fi, also came from the US. So if we're targeting US investment money, that will investment will have to come from the US and be the use of white space equipment. 
Where can we go to price point on the manufacturer at scale? As I said, and Keith has endorsed this, it's about chipsets, it's about the whole process of, of manufacture. Where would I like to see it? Well, that's an easy one to answer. I would like to see it in, in, in alignment with ubiquity pricing. Unfortunately, that's never going to happen. Yeah? But um, we can't bring it down to that mass-produced um, sort of pricing that, that, that's going to happen. But at current pricing models, I believe it is possible to actually get to a point where we could at least get a 40% reduction and ideally probably aim for 50 um, with, with, with scale. Um, I, would, I would be amazed if we could get it further than that, but yeah, it is possible. So yeah, on my wish list, ubiquity pricing, the thing would fly, but I, I know realistically we're not going to get there. So it's, it's really about the scale models, and not just in South Africa, in Africa, and any other country in the global community that has passing regulations on white space which will allow us to deploy. I hope that gets to your question somehow. Thank you. It does indeed. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, let's go to the next presenter. Dr. Tandeka Ellenson, CEO of the Moses Kotane Institute. That's the research agency of the KZN province. She on? Yeah. I'm go. online, yes, I'm here. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. My role is to talk about uh, government's role into uh, this whole space, especially in support of what is happening uh, today. Um, government uh, is very important as a player in this, uh, in that, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Oh yes, I'm audible. Um, in, in that government creates enabling policies, uh, government ena uh, creates enabling uh, strategies. For an example, in Guazulu Natal, we developed the digital transformation strategy, uh, which assists uh, in, in, in connectivity. Uh, we know that uh, the challenge in Guazulu Natal uh, is that we are 70% rural, and we know that on the basis of uh, the CSIR research that was done, we are not connected. We are only 27% connected in terms of government and private network, but our communities are also not uh, connected. So um, the digital transformation strategy that we have uh, uh, placed connectivity as pillar number one uh, in the first priority uh, of the province, which means that the TV white space uh, uh, intervention that we are gathered uh, about today is resolving that problem, and it's, tr it's, it's part of um, contribution towards making sure that the people uh, are connected, especially in the rural areas, especially in areas where um, we have challenges in terms of um, fiber we can't reach, and uh, TV white space then is, is, is assisting us in that in, the, in that manner. Um, as government, we are also uh, responsible for digital skilling, which means that our SMMEs uh, need need to be uh, trained, and um, the emerging ISPs need to be trained, and everybody in the pool. And in, and in the space of connectivity needs to be trained. And we as government, through the Moses Kotane Institute that I'm representing today, we are playing that role in ensuring that uh, people are digitally skilled. Another area um, that government is responsible for is funding. It is important that incubators are funded. There is, for an example, you see a, 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 the, 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 the smart exchange which plays quite a big role in Guazulu Natal in terms of uh, incubation, in terms of developing SMMEs. And it is very important that such organizations are supported so that they, because they have a muscle to replicate and to cause a ripple effect uh, in terms of development uh, in, 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 at a lower base in terms of uh, our, our, our communities. So funding is very important. 
And with that, we are also encouraging in, uh, investors to, in, uh, to, to, to come and fund either the incubators or the SMMEs that are in the space so that our people can be uh, connected. But as government, we are also saying incentives for investors are very important because that's when uh, we, we see uh, quite a bigger uptake in terms of uh, connectivity. So incentives and tax rebates are very important. Um, tax rebates in terms of the companies. Uh, we've seen ad notes today and we know that they're doing uh, quite a, a good job. Uh, ad notes is in KZN and they're doing quite a great job in terms of connecting people here in KwaZulu Natal through TV white space. So that is very important. Research is another area that is very important. Uh, companies such as the Moses Kotana Institute, which I'm representing, is responsible uh, for making sure that we track the population use. We uh, identify the barriers and the levels of the digital literacy. Uh, we still have not moved in, in that much in terms of connectivity. And this is why we are so fond of TV White Space, because it, it, it is making a difference in terms of making sure that we increase the uptake and the, and the percentage of connectivity and making an impact in society. Innovation support is another area of importance uh, where you see government playing quite a huge role in supporting either innovators, turning innovators into entrepreneurs or turning entrepreneurs into innovators. We've seen MKI uh, in Guazulu Natal, TIA, CS, CSIR, um, the Innovation Hub in, in Gauteng, and so on. And those are the role players uh, that are supporting either communities or entrepreneurs and innovators into making sure that we, we, we move forward in terms of um, uh, the country. So that's the role of government, but also uh, government pro promotes uh, the use or the uptake in terms of local providers. There's nothing as good as having uh, 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 citizens using the, pr the product that is lo either locally manufactured or a service that is provided by a local innovator or an entrepreneur. And that is very important uh, aspect in terms of government's uh, promotions to promote local providers. In KwaZulu Natal, as the Moses Kotane Institute, we have established um, the nine digital centers and I'll just beam so you can see the location of these digital centers. We are, uh, these digital centers are, are located in rural areas and the aim for that is uh, to make sure that we are uh, connecting the rural people. Uh, I think you can see the slide now where you see the red pins, that's where the digital centers are, are, are located. And these digital centers have got computers, 3D printers, they've got a smart screen, and they are connected, there's electricity and water. We're working with municipalities, even though they are nine at the moment, but we are aiming to at least establish 100 in the next uh, five years. So we are looking for partners to, to come and invest and assist us in establishing these centers because they provide access to infrastructure and co connectivity to communities which otherwise would not have access to such uh, facilities. And with the 100 um, uh, digital centers that we are hoping to, 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 to achieve in the next uh, five years, we are hoping to use TV white space uh, uh, to connect these digital centers so that uh, at least we know that uh, the, the centers are connected. This is how the digital centers look like. Uh, I've just provided one example of what the centers look like and they are really assisting the communities in the space. So there's quite a role for government to play in this and we are quite happy to partner with uh, various stakeholders in as far as this is concerned as government. But at this point in time, we are uh, partnering with local um, uh, partners such as Smart Exchange, uh, I, uh, I, like IT Forum is part of, uh, is one of our strategic partners and so many other partners. CSIR also uh, is assisting in terms of making sure that such uh, happens. So that is where we are. Uh, Chairperson, Prof, I will end there for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ellenson. 
Uh, any quick comment or question or clarification for Dr. Ellenson? Okay, if not, okay, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, let's go to the final presenter who hasn't spoken and then we'll open it up. And I know some of the SMMEs uh, also in, uh, are in the panel as well, so you have a chance at the end. Um, this is Bill Brown from Metric Systems Corporation in the US. Is he on? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, we got a little bit of um Okay. Okay. Okay, we can, but we have feedback. I'm not sure why. Uh, do you want to try again, Bill? Bill, are you there? We lost him. Uh, I see Dr. Yo is on. Dr. Yo, are you there? Excuse me? Uh, Dr. Yo, are you there? Yo. Yes. Uh, you can present now if you, if you can. If you have two or three uh, minutes. Uh, okay, okay. We, uh, thank you very much. Just a moment. Yeah, please go ahead. Dr. Ho Sang Yo is the CEO yeah, of uh, Internet yeah, yeah. in Korea. Yeah, yeah. Did, uh, did you see uh, my presentation? No. Excuse Not me. yet. Just a moment. Otherwise, you, you can go ahead because you only have about two, two minutes or so because we have to be very brief. Okay. But we uh, have your uh, slides. Yeah. We can share them with the audience later. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah. I see. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 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 in Korea, TV white space uh, application service, uh, uh, the uh, rural uh, internet and the smart uh, transmit need, uh, smart construction and the public safety. Yeah, usually the main technology is uh, TV white space and Wi-Fi, because uh, TV white space and uh, Wi-Fi are one license and uh, the charge fee communication cases. Uh, so many people like uh, TV white space, uh, including the local government and uh, uh, public agency. In Smart Farm, as the member of a household to live in rural and uh, mountain village increased, the demand for internet in the rural area is increasing. In the smart city, public Wi-Fi service is uh, uh, available in Korea buses. Currently, 5G wireless backbone is used, so communication charges 
are expensive and monthly data use is limited. It was verified to provide public Wi-Fi service with the TV high space wires backward to the bus. In smart construction, until recently, smartphone service was not available at the underground tunnel construction site. Currently, communication network for safety, system cameras, worker location identification, and IoT service are provided. In the emergency network of the public safety, TV white space wireless backhaul is very useful in underground and mountainous areas. Okay, <laughs> my presentation is that's all. Yeah. Thank you. Have a chance presentation. Thank thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yo. He has a comprehensive slide deck which we'll share with you after the meeting. But but any any comments or question for him? Yes, there is one question. Please go ahead. Your name and institution. Uh, hello, my name is Brendan Raw. Um, uh, Dr. Yo, your company is called Internet, I believe. Um, is, uh, are the Internet products, are they licensed for use in South Africa? Yeah. Uh, uh, last uh, April, I went to South Africa. Uh, I either demonstrated some people. Yeah, and so uh, two or three months later, I will show uh, the demonstration. Uh, in South Africa, we have a good partner, Africa. And so we will cooperate with uh, Africa. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Yo, and thank you for the question. So yeah, uh, thanks to Dr. Yo. So we have yeah, about you. 10 minutes or so. We can have an open discussion and come back to some of the matters that were raised earlier, if, if need be. Um, so yes, we can open it, open it up now. Yes, sir, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, well, mine was just to follow up on Cindy's comments around the uh, you know, the funding and the processes that are, we, we actually experience when we're dealing with uh, uh, um, these entities, uh, TR and uh, Department of, of uh, Higher Learning Institution. But mine was just to get, uh, I've forgotten the name of the gentleman who came. Mr. Ndlamini. Yes, From Mr. Ndlamini. <laughs> yes. I believe he's still here. Yes, he's there oh, at the back. Yes, I was just wanted to just get his uh, insight or maybe his comment on how is a trip to Silicon Valley contributing, you know, like when you see government department employees traveling to Silicon Valley to go and learn about uh, how to uh, assist our entrepreneurs in South Africa. How does that contribute in assisting uh, our business locally? I, I believe there was a recent trip where a delegation went to Silicon Valley, and it's quite confusing how that is actually can assist us as a country move forward in resolving local problems which need local solutions. Thank you. Okay, thanks. We have several government officials on, and any of them can respond. Uh, Mr. Dlamini, do you want to respond? <laughs> okay. I mean, I don't, I don't think we should necessarily, you know, pile everything on to him, but yeah, go ahead, please.
Uh, I think, Mr. Lamini, the question is around government employees going to these countries and leaving entrepreneurs and students behind. I think that's, let me just, just to, to supplement my question, uh, because I think that's the issue where the, you know, critical things that require uh, certain skills, which in our observation seem to be lacking in some of the departments, they seem to carry that mandate, you know, and you then get confused what the purpose of the trip. Uh, government employees trying to be entrepreneurs as well, or um, we will try to get clarity around that. No, I don't think government employees are trying to be entrepreneurs. Maybe it depends on the agenda of the meeting that uh, the people go there for. For instance, uh, there's a program of uh, the European, uh, funded by the Europeans, called the uh, the European Framework for Innovation, which is the uh, Research and Innovation Program. Uh, part of the delegates that we normally send there vary. It includes also government officials, researchers from universities, researchers from science councils, and also people from industry. So it's not just government. So I only know what the agenda was at this particular meeting that you are referring to. But it's not always the case that government officials only take themselves there. It depends on the nature of the agenda being discussed there. Like I've just given you an example of some of the programs that we have taken uh, people from industry, SMMEs to these particular meetings in Europe. Thanks, thanks Mr. Dlamini and thanks for the question. Okay, uh, other, other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ndumis Wachlingo. Uh, I'm the Strategic Partnerships Manager at the CSIR. Um, I thought maybe it's important to highlight uh, something in response to a question that was asked earlier. Um, how does the CSIR or agencies that are contacted by uh, DSI, etc., um, how do they uh, evaluate, you know, proposals, uh, etc., and the allocation of funding? So the CSIR has is very it's a very diverse um, organization and uh, has many different aspects to it. So depending on what the purpose is intended for any particular funding. Um, you will find that um, the terms of reference will indicate how is the money intended to be uh, distributed, etc. In some instances, there will be internal evaluation. In many instances, there actually are external evaluations, panels uh, con uh, constituted of people from, say, universities, the private sector, entrepreneurs. Um, the CSR also has a program called the Entrepreneur in Residence Program, which actually has actual uh, entrepreneurs that serve as a panel that can be called upon every so often, depending on whatever program has been brought to the fore mm -hmm. and what the intent of the program is and how it is to be evaluated. Then it's given to the panel to make uh, recommendations, evaluations and recommendations. So I thought it's important to, to highlight that, and that it's a whole range of engagements and not just internal uh, evaluations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I think that does throw some light on the matter. Um, yes, there was a hand towards the back there, and then Cindy. And then we probably need to wrap it up unless there's any other questions. Yeah, yeah please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's Genesis Pasha from iLook Telecoms. Um, 
Um, the gentleman, I think Mr. Tlamini, right? Um, the moment he stand the um, throne of the microphone, he said something very important with regards to uh, when he mentioned hunger. So um, from our side as um, entrepreneurs, as SMMEs, sometimes we do actually get to, uh, to ask ourselves the same question that is actually government hungry to see success of um, young black people or black entrepreneurs that are trying to fill the gap where we see that we can we can actually make a difference and we can we can ma make a change into the socioeconomic issues that are facing our country for for example you know sometimes um it, it it gets a bit daunting when you look at certain things or certain factors from outside because of you probably uh, wouldn't know where to begin when you look at failures um because i'm thinking like um, i take me as for example you know i'm growing up in a corporate sector and then a um, couple of years and then from the corporate sector and then I moved into government um, duties that I was doing. And then because of I come from an, an SME background where I have passions of completing certain things that can actually help the, the country move forward, it's really, you know, assisting the youth, for example. So um, the moment there is um, certain challenges that require funding, for example, the private sector works a certain way. It's got its own uh, ways of doing things, especially when it comes to adjudication processes and stuff. And then when it comes to the government sector as well, they have their own methods where they actually uh, go ahead when they're assisting small businesses uh, for funding purposes. But then I'm not sure if maybe government on its own, as much as you said that um, there is failures from the SMMEs, um, where I'm saying sometimes we do ask ourselves uh, with regards to is government really um, hungry to see success of SMMEs making it through? For, for example, uh, with growing um, the ICT sector as we are here today. Because if we do know that as much as certain things, we don't like speaking, to, uh, speaking about them because sometimes, you know, in this country, it becomes difficult to call a spoon a spoon. I mean, we do know that in government, there's always many, many challenges where we know certain, especially when there's money involved, you know, certain things happen in a way that is not favorable for people that are actually passionate about what they do. Because of any, for example, in this venue right now, I can guarantee you that majority of us, we are here because of we are following passion of gap that we saw in the neighborhoods or in the societies where we come from. So the reason why we wake up in the morning, we sleep late at night, because if we want to see a change that is uh, 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 um, taking place in the neighborhoods where we come from. So. Because of us entrepreneurs, obviously we network. So as we network, we meet people, we meet other uh, um, directors, we meet other business owners. So the, the BITF um, um, a spokesperson earlier on mentioned about, um, she knows or BITF is an organization, they have a list of SMMEs where they don't understand how are they failing to get funding. But because of we network, we do meet other people that are receiving funding, but then when we look, you know, when we gauge um, what they do and what patients they have, you know, like you, you don't get a similar ground where you actually end up asking yourself, how are they funding other SMEs that are not even you know um, having the hunger that other SMEs actually have? So sometimes you know we ask those questions that um, is there a certain rule that government is using to do the funding where in return when they when they turn around then they see failure uh, from SMEs that didn't even have a passion from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, Cindy from the BITF. Um, I'm not going to take long. I just want to share our findings when we work with SMMEs. Um, SMMEs are not asking for salaries. They are not asking for freebies. They are asking for assistance to get their businesses up and running. They need office space. They need mentorship. They need resources that are unique to their business people to evaluate their business model so that they can grow and not be reliant on business, on, on government funding. Um, so when we approach these agencies, we don't, the doors don't open. However, if I were aligned to a research institute at TUT, it's easier to get the door open. Why is the exclusion between those that are not aligned to institutions and those that are? Can we first answer that? How do we then build the bridge to bring in the guys in the fields that are struggling, that are hustling, to get the same support as the ones in institutions? It's that simple. And that's a very 
good place for us to, to end. It's a question, but I think it's, it's also a challenge. Um, so if we've celebrated success today, some of the challenges uh, that the SMMEs are facing have been shared with us. Um, yes, it's a very daunting path. Yes, there are failures along the way. But I believe all these experiences, even for people who start an enterprise that fails, I mean, those people take away that valuable experience that they can invest into something else in the future, even though the enterprise may well have uh, as it were, failed. Um, one of the things I think we've heard today is that there's a need to address some of these challenges. That's, that's what I'm hearing. And I think we need to have further engagements to see how we can make this ecosystem work. Uh, and it, it requires, like I said, it requires a village to raise these successful companies. So it's not just the government's responsibility alone nor the private sector, nor civil society, nor industry associations. Uh, I think all of us somehow need to, to come and address these, these various issues and make this, this whole ecosystem work. So with that, I think we only have a few minutes, still half past. I think I should hand it back to the, the program director. And just to thank all of you for, for participating in the panel. Uh, let's continue the, the discussion and engagement hereafter. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Mjumo. Now, in closing the session is Dr. Wakaba, who is making his way to the front. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director. Good afternoon to all, esteemed uh, stakeholders, speakers, panelists, guests. I think the discussion that we've, you know, just experienced is one that's uh, very important. Um, it's been frank. There's been also opportunities for us to, to clarify certain issues, but also some questions have been raised that require us to to go back and, and rethink how we, uh, the approach that we take in um, delivering on our objective of, of um, you know, narrowing the digital divide and also the objective of um, inclusive socioeconomic growth. So we've reached the cool down phase of our program today and it's been a privilege to interact with a broad range of stakeholders and participate in the cross-pollination um, about harnessing spectrum to foster digital inclusion. This TV white space ecosystem workshop is a watershed moment for bridging the digital divide in this country and the continent at large. The deliberations and linkages across the TV white space ecosystem, the ones that have been uh, discussed at this event, will bolster our prospects for inclusive economic growth through the exciting opportunity of reusing uh, television bands, that and beyond, uh, for broadband access in hard to reach and sparsely populated areas. And one thing that has really stood out, I think, are the stories um, from the network operators. Now, these are real people speaking of real impact, real lives have been changed, and that is certainly an inspirational um, aspect of, of what we've seen today. And it's something that can be carried, I think, to generate momentum for even further impact in future. And so this aspect, the impact that's been reported today, and of course the workshop itself, are the culmination of a collaborative effort by several stakeholders. On behalf of the CSIR, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the contribution of the United Kingdom Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the FCDO, for funding the CSR-led project. Um, and also, it's also important for us to recognize the UNDP, um, you know, for funding the prior project, the prior work that enabled the rural TV white space network operators to implement um, the program that we have, we have heard about today. Then, of course, the operators themselves, they were here and 
their names have been mentioned a number of times. It doesn't hurt to mention it once again. I have the strong feeling that these are names that we will hear about again in future uh, as they grow from strength to strength. Ad notes, Black Equations, Katabo Technologies, Danzani Mobile. These network operators have gone a long way in advancing the cause of connecting the unserved and underserved communities in South Africa. And I think the example we've seen today is admirable, one that certainly can be you know, taken further in the country and even beyond the borders of our country. I'd also like to thank the speakers and panelists that participated in the event, including our keynote speaker, His Excellency Anthony Philipson, the British High Commissioner to South Africa. These valuable contributions have shaped this workshop and planted seeds for even greater impact in the TV white space ecosystem. In fact, talk has extended beyond you know, the TV, the TV band. Um, there are even you know, newer modes that are in development and that will be re revealed uh, soon in time. We also have special delegations from the various provinces, including those specifically delegated to attend by the Premier of Kozulu Natal. Uh, we thank you for participating in this workshop and your presence is certainly appreciated. And this initiative has received an incredible amount of support from a wide range of individuals and entities. Um, and this spans government, and when we say government, uh, government departments, um, we've seen um, you know, DSI, we've seen DCDT, and then, of course, there are agencies of government as well, such as TIA and so forth. Um, and the regulator, you can, you know, one should not forget that. Then, of course, there's the private sector, there are the SMMEs, there are the people who have the experience on the ground, who are here sharing that experience. Um, and their experience is beneficial to, to everyone else. Um, people who are in a similar boat as them and those who sit on the other side of the fence that often have to make decisions. Um, and it's very good to be informed. Uh, by the experience that is there on the ground. And then, of course, there's civil society. We are grateful for all of that. And essentially, through this continued collaboration across the different types of uh, stakeholders, this TV white space technology, and I say TV white space, that and beyond, essentially, will be harnessed uh, to further you know, make gains when it comes to addressing the, the triple challenge that we have in the country today. And finally, a word of appreciation is extended to the CSR team that has worked tirelessly to make this initiative a success. There are a number of people to name there, um, and I, I'm always reluctant there because I know I will leave out people, <laughs> okay? <laughs> But, but there's, there's one, one suspect uh, that's over there <laughs> that I should name. Uh, Dr. Luzangu Mpupe, we, we truly appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Fiseha Nakuria as well is, is, on, is on the line. We're thankful uh, to the teams. We know that you're backed by teams. Um, and we know that the interaction that you've had with everyone um, has been very fruitful. And then, of course, there's our program director, uh, Ms. Obakeng Ratlocho, who has steered this workshop with distinction. Uh, we thank you for that. And with that, I think I'll stop here. I think we've now uh, cooled down, <laughs> and we're, we're ready for the ready for the cheese. Uh, and and as I'm as I'm as I'm looking here, thank you as well to the facilitator of our panel. I think you did a stellar job. In, in guiding the discussion uh, and steering the ship, uh, bringing it to shore. Thank you once again, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Wakaba. We would like to honor the panels, uh, panelists rather, that have joined a very intriguing and very challenging discussion. Um, not to seclude anybody, but we would like to specifically call Mr. Natimbele, Lerato Rampana, Songezo, Mhambi, Hanif Manuel, the representative from the KZN 
Premier's Office, Mr. Jamini, Keith Patel, and Professor, just to give them a token of appreciation from the CSR and FCDO. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, is it to me? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, auspicious guests. It has been an awesome, awesome day. I am delighted that I. I am very much delighted that we were in a very interactive environment. Thank you for physically attending the workshop. We truly appreciate it, and it, it feels so good to see people. It really does. Can you kindly just join us in the foyer? And uh, you're welcome for adult drinks. There is three served per person. We look forward to uh, networking and interacting with you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Thank you so much, Patricia. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Safe travels.